Feels good to be back in saddle again. We had a couple of days off. Gavin was featured in the local Panic Festival. Uh, shout out to him uh, for getting that done. Um, Thanks, bro. No clip crew. Yeah, represented Kansas City. No clip um, nation. Yeah, found footage <laughs> films. Um, so yeah, super happy for Gavin. That was awesome. But yeah, so anyway, back to the grindstone, back to getting our, our content out to the hungry people, the e-huddled masses, you know, <laughs> um, super excited to get back in the swing of things. And, you know, we just thought it called for a tried and true gutter guard, you know, a little bit of a little bit of a back to our roots moment. We've got destiny. We've got Norm Finkelstein, Storm and Norman. Uh, we've got Brianna Joy Gray. And of course, we'll probably get into a little bit of the row Jogan. It's going to be quite a feast today, a smorgasbord of content. But yeah, uh, how you doing, dude? I'm doing great, man. Doing great. It's good to be back on the podcast. Was a little bit busy over the weekend with my new movie, No Clip, premiering at Panic Fest. But now it's back to the real world, back to the vanguard, uh, back to the good shit, back to the comrades and the homies in chat. Um, so it's great to be here, guys. Really miss you guys. Um, I, I know we just took a few days off, but it just seems like we've been away if for so long. I go longer than 72 hours. Like we even dropped a <laughs> circle jerk podcast, but we were like, we're, uh, our audience is going to forget about us. Fuck my life, dude. We're like, you know, I, I, I like, it's just, it's part of our life. Now we've done this for four years and basically every single fucking day, unless they're like, or every other day, it just stays in your life. It's part, it's a habit at this point. It's like brushing your teeth or walking your dog or something. Anyway, uh, I guess we've got to shout out our patrons, uh, lovely fuckers that keep the lights on around here. Keep us coming at you. Keep us consistent as we can be uh you know comrades van guardians super van guardians you're all comrades to us um but yeah it really helps us uh, keep the show going whenever i'm like a little disappointed in the state of our you know media career i'm like hey at least you know a couple hundred of you fuckers think that our show is worth tuning in for and even you know forking over some of your hard-earned cash for so we really appreciate you guys yeah, hundred percent. The uh, Patreon support makes what we do possible, guys. So if you enjoy the show and want to see even more from us, hit up that link in the description. It keeps us one hundred percent sustainable as an independent channel. Uh, so we really appreciate that, guys. And it is just five bucks a month to get your own name up there on the shout out screen. So hit that up, guys. Um, also, Tony, I saw Tony was clamoring for us to talk about the Anna Kasparian Kyle Crystal Y'all interview. Know what we think of Anna. Yeah, was there? I didn't. I didn't really see much that was worth reacting to in that interview. I didn't. I didn't watch the whole thing. From what I saw, it, it didn't get really spicy. It kind of just seemed like a you know chill conversation, which is totally fine. Obviously, they have the right to you know have a chill conversation with Anna Kasperi. They don't have to you know go in there on our behalf and and be like fuck you, Anna, no. or even but, on Kyle's behalf. Yeah, because Anna's been mean to Kyle before too. <laughs> yeah, I think they just kind of recently you know. Made squash peace the beef, squash the beef, right? Which might be why things didn't get spicy. They're like, all right, we just squash the beef. We don't want to, you know, automatically rip the band aid right back off by asking some really tough questions. But if there's something specific you think that we should react to, Tony, feel free to send us uh, that, send it our way, you know, give us the timestamp, whatever, because I'd, I'd be down to. I just didn't really see all that much that seemed, you know, worth uh, talking about, but, you know, still a good conversation, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I did also want to throw up the new logo design for the Vanguard. While we were away, our good homie Matt from the Letter Hack, uh, shout out to him. Go like and subscribe and follow his cartoon work. He drafted up a new logo for us. Gavin and I have been wanting to do a logo for a long time. New logo that kind of captures the new essence of the show, um, you know, kind of where we're at in our media career. So this guy right here is going to be the new Vanguard logo. You can see it right here. I thought he did a fucking awesome job. We were super stoked about this. Gavin's got his smoking super chronic Seattle supersonics jacket on, which I thought was the perfect touch. Uh, me in a solid color t-shirt as I'm prone to wear. Uh, anyway, I thought it was awesome. We were super excited about it. Uh, we already uploaded it on Twitter. Uh, and the live streams over we're going to update it on youtube as well so super big shout out to matt uh we really appreciate him 
Yeah, shout out to Matt at the Letter Hack, man. Such an awesome logo, such a great new uh, representation of our brand. So we're super excited to have that as our new piece of art. And yeah, dude, I mean, so much better than some of those AI logos we were fucking with for uh, a while. I know, I know, we, I know, we gave it our best. We were experimenting we with were the like, technology. Can we try and like use AI and then also Photoshop to make something good when neither of us can draw at all? No, no. <laughs> You can't do that. Trust me. Uh, there also AI shit. You can just tell it's AI as soon as you look at it. Now this is something that was done, you know, for us by somebody that watches the show, that likes the show, uh, that we're homies with. Um, so this was awesome. Uh, you know, very stoked to have this as the new logo for the Vanguard. Um, yeah, and also shout out to you, Robin, for the very first super chat of the live stream. I know this isn't sports guard, but I just have to say that my school, UConn, won its sixth national championship in men's. Yeah, UConn's become a quiet powerhouse in both men and women's uh, basketball. You guys obviously went on, I think, probably one of the greatest runs of uh, women's national sports championships uh, in basketball history, uh, if I'm not mistaken. But I'd never, I mean, UConn had always been like a mid-tier, a mid-tier men's college basketball, at least during the time that I followed that, which would have been about a decade ago, the last time I, like 2016 would have been the last time I even had any foggiest idea what was going on in college men's basketball. But I did start watching the women's tournament again this year. Um, Obviously, UConn lost in the final four of the women's game um, in, in a real fucking, you know, really interesting game. But anyway, shout out to you. No, uh, I don't follow college sports too much, just about as much as I laid out Haven't right there. You and Salisa have been following the like basketball stuff or something? The women's college sports, though. Yeah, oh, okay. lost in the final four, uh, which was what I was more familiar with. The Caitlin Clark arc, was she going to be able to beat the South Carolina? Also, shout out to the lady that coaches uh, South Carolina. I don't know if you saw that. We can pull that up. That's actually a good sports guard segue. Uh, the South Carolina women's basketball coach uh, is that the one that looks like Hillary Clinton? No, no. Okay. <laughs> uh, this woman, that lady, that, Don Staley is who I was talking about. That other lady, she coaches for LSU. Uh, but Don Staley, she came out the night, I think it was the night of or the night before the women's national championship. And they asked her about like trans kids in sports. And she was like, I know people are going to get all up in their feelings about this and like all fucking crazy about this. But she was like, but my view is that if you're a woman, you should be able to play sports. And then it was like a big, like conservative media thing. But I was like, W for you. I'm cheering for you. Um, and you know, Caitlin Clark had a great game, but she didn't, you know, she wasn't able to seal the deal. It's just that it's you, because she's you, trans. That uh, that, <laughs> that explains uh, why she's so talented. The Carolina team was just so fucking stacked, man. Yeah. Just so stacked. Um, yeah. but anyway, shout out to you, Robin. Yeah, uh, thank you so I, much, Robin. I'm excited that women's sports is getting more attention. I was actually talking to my dad about that the other day because Casey Currents three and zero. I'm like, across the board, women's sports is just getting a lot more attention than it ever has. And also, if you're a person that consumes a lot of sports media, which I'm prone to do, because sometimes I just want to turn off the politics in my brain and just listen to something that's like got a little less, you know, little lower stakes to it. You know, who's getting traded where what that kind of thing but now there's a lot more women in uh sports broadcasting so wow. woke pretty cool to see that too you know yeah i wonder why that is do you do you, uh i mean People it's obviously just, a good thing yeah making an effort to i mean for the longest time when i was a kid i mean it was all men only men on sports radio on sports network on sports centers all that shit men 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 and now you, you know like one of my favorite shows to watch because i'm a big uh i, I was uh, we had a running back he played for the chiefs for a while but he made his big career out uh in uh he played for the Eagles, but he's a big Andy Reid guy. So I listen to his podcast a lot, uh, uh, LaShawn McCoy. And he's on this other show, Speak. I watch that. But anyway, they have a female co-host. There's a couple of shows where they've now introduced like female co-hosts. And it's a good, interesting perspective. You know what I mean? It's less of a sausage fest. Like, when, uh, like I remember one time this... Um, I was watching ESPN and uh, one of these like old, like, you know, big old former linemen was talking about his uh, gardener. And he was like, yeah, you know, even this, uh, even my gardener, this amigo, you know, uh, being like kind of racist as fuck. And then this Cuban lady who was on the panel, like cuts him off and like shuts him the fuck up. And I was like, see, this is the kind of shit you wouldn't have seen on ESPN uh, <laughs> when I was growing up. Oh God. Yeah. That's, that's super cringe. Um, one, one story I did also want to get your opinion on Zach. I'm not sure if you Saw all of this uh, brouhaha surrounding RFK Jr., but there's a new clip of his New York campaign director laying out what is being described as a clear 
plan. And a lot of people in the liberal media, high profile Democrats like Jamie Harrison, as you see here, are really running with this kind of acting like it's a smoking gun proof that RFK is actually just trying to help Donald Trump. Um, so I'm not sure if you saw this yet, but let's take a quick look here and we can talk about, you know, the substance. Because like Who's I said, this lady, uh, she's the New York, I guess, the New York campaign director for. Okay, so she's on his payroll. Yeah, absolutely. And she's talking to some voters here trying to, uh, you know, lay out an, an interesting strategy. So let's take a look. So there's no Biden voters in the House, right? No. OK, good. <laughs> Things, I guess, will change over time because you do have to only pick one candidate at the end of the day. But the Kennedy voter and the Trump voter the enemy, our mutual enemy is Biden. Since Biden is counting on us with Bobby in the mix, my, my thought is for the Republicans. See, Bobby right now, he's pulling from both sides. Right now, he's actually pulling a little bit more from Biden, which explains why the DNC is kind of ganging up on him. They have a special committee to go after independent candidates. Yeah, they say independent candidates, like non-affiliated candidates, they really mean Bobby, because Bobby's the only third party that anybody's taking seriously. So they developed a committee just to go after him and to get him off of the ballot in any way they can, especially it seems as though they're going after the battleground states more than the deep blue states. Bobby's moving the blues on his own. If the Republicans has accepted the fact that New York, Maryland, Chicago, uh, Illinois, California, New Jersey, Connecticut, most of the Northeast is going to go blue, why wouldn't we put our vote to Bobby and at least get rid of Biden and get those 28 electoral votes in New York? The card's a little wrong. It says 26 electoral votes. Give those 28 electoral votes to Bobby rather than to Biden, thereby uh, reducing Biden's 270. And we all know how that works, right? Yeah, so Kennedy, what do you think Kennedy, about this? Kennedy, 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 <laughs> Kennedy. Oh boy, what the fuck did you think this guy was going to go down without <laughs> swinging? That this guy didn't have a fucking uh, bone to pick with the establishment? This guy doesn't want to go down as, like, one, he already feels like he got the shaft because of Tulsi. For one, he went out and got the Aldi brand Tulsi Gabbard, that Nicole Shanahan lady. And now he's like, fuck, that, no, that didn't work. I thought I could just replace it. This look, this woman looks a lot like Tulsi Gabbard, except she's rich, <laughs> uh, which works really well for me because I need more more money and uh you know then she'll be my vice president and they were like no we don't like that smoke and mirror so he's like all right enough with going after a legitimate vote enough with going after a legitimate contingency what are my options here i'm surveying the field let's get machiavellian bobby says to himself he says let me think like my forefathers did what can I do to bring down the country while uplifting myself? That's what Kennedys do. That's what we're good at, right? Our name carries us, uh, and the nation is our wind. Well, we are our own sails, right? Whatever it is that I'm getting at. What's the thing about uh, his move here is that it makes sense, right? The dumbest people uh, are the Trump voters, right? So if he wants to swindle people, he realizes that he could poach people who are the most disenfranchised on earth. That's a Trump voter in Maine. That's a Trump voter in California. That's a Trump voter where the state is definitely not going to go to Donald Trump, right? Uh, in the same way that we kind of make the sales pitch to uh, people who are disenfranchised by Joe Biden. We're like, dude, if you live in Texas or if you live in Missouri, vote for Jill Stein. Vote your conscience, dude. Vote for who you want. Push them forward on a you know national vote count level because you're, you know, the Electoral College is basically, you know, you know, making it so your vote is irrelevant. That is honestly, it, it's it's going to be an effective sales pitch, I think. I mean, maybe it's not because it, it, it does involve like a little bit of critical thinking and that might be a bridge too far for the average Trump electorate. I'm not sure at this point. But it, it, as far as the strategy, if you're looking at the chessboard from where RFKJ is, right, and we're putting on our neutral analysis, that's his only play left because he's not going to get an electoral W uh, without poaching Donald Trump voters. I think, it, and, and, not, and, and when I say electoral w i mean one electoral vote which i think is kind of like the threshold for him for like being successful if he can pull in some electoral college votes he'll feel like he you know really nailed it yeah i actually agree it's it's low-key kind of a smart move if you're trying to target voters in the state of new york for example a state which is obviously going to vote for biden then yeah i think it's actually a pretty sound pitch to rfk voters saying like hey you know why throw your vote away on trump you could at least vote for bobby in a state like new york um so you know i think it, i think it makes sense finger to the man yeah that being said i do think that you know the way that this uh 
this uh, campaign director lady worded it. I do think it was pretty, you know, like ridiculous. And it kind of just made it super easy for the mainstream media to, you know, take this clip and, and run with it and say, see, they're saying the quiet part out loud. They're just trying to help Donald Trump. But which what if that's I, the point? To help Donald Trump? No, to outrage the media, right? So uh, if, I, if, I, if I'm sitting here, right, and, and it was funny, I was just watching a documentary about Michael Avenetti, uh, and I was like, wow, that guy's fucking, that guy's nuts. But anyway, like if I'm sitting here, right, and I'm just trying to be the antagonist, and I'm just trying to always have the camera on me, and I'm trying to absorb, you know, and I'm trying to play all the angles like this, what what does Donald Trump's base love? They love the outrage of liberal media. They love the snowflakes. So what does this do? It simultaneously gives them instruction, which is, hey, don't throw your vote away in New York. If you live in upstate New York and you fucking hate Joe Biden and you don't want to be, uh, you know, associated with those city slick and yuppies down in the city, uh, you know, vote for RFK J. Uh, you know what? He's a Kennedy Democrat, but, you know, that they've abandoned the party. He's, you know, he's with us on the vaccine, all that, whatever, you know, whatever his sales pitch is going to be in the nitty gritty when he like triangulates on the, you know, people he's trying to poach uh but those people are going to love that he outrages the liberal media so then it's free press that he doesn't have to pay for when they blast this all over twitter look at what he's trying to do he's trying to take down joe biden and they're like hmm that might actually be a good idea that might actually be a good idea to take down joe biden now i don't want to sit here and say that i think it's a good idea to vote for rfk but i think that he has a good he has his bet he has a better political strategy than any of the other candidates i've seen emerge given um you know his limited funds yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see if the VP thing does slow him down because Nicole Shanahan has basically done no interview appearances. She's not really put her neck out there as a true running mate would. It really does seem like he appointed her just uh, for her money. And then I guess, you know, in exchange, she got a little bit of clout and name recognition, but she doesn't seem particularly interested in going out there and exposing herself to, you know, interviews and scrutiny and all that kind of stuff, which is pretty interesting. And of course, as you mentioned, Zach, we did get the official news that as we suspected, Tulsi Gabbard turned down RFK's offer to be his running mate. Um, yeah, declined an offer to be RFK Jr.'s running mate in his independent presidential bid. I've met with Kennedy several times, and we have become good friends. He asked if I would be his running mate after careful consideration. I respectfully declined, uh, which is pretty funny. And as we've said from the beginning, obviously she wants to you know, be Trump's vice president or at least part of his cabinet, which I think is much more likely. I don't, I don't think she has much of a chance at all at actually becoming his VP. But I do think there's a chance she could find her way into his administration. In fact, there was even reports back in 2016 that Tulsi met with Trump to be considered for a role in his administration back in the day, something that was kind of brushed under the rug when Tulsi tried to run for the Democratic Party nomination in 2020. But yeah, it's not it's not it wouldn't be unprecedented for that meeting to happen. And I think that's pretty obvious why she turned down RFK. She's you know hoping that that happens. Uh, yeah, I think that she's always been a career opportunist, right? I think that Abby Martin hit the nail on the head, right? Way back when, when people were still entertaining the idea. And she was like, I don't trust her because I don't see a through line for her convictions. How could you be so pro one thing and so anti another if you actually felt this way? You can't be, you know, pro drone strikes and then against on the ground invasion and then call yourself anti-war that's just pro-terrorism you know what i mean oh you're pro covert terrorism and not direct warfare like that's not an admirable quality right uh and i think that's always been the case for tulsi gabbard and then of course going back to the fact that back in the day she was willing to pander to people who didn't like gay people in the democratic party and try and poach them uh, all that kind of stuff and then you know one of the last things she did on the way out was like uh it was like a bill to make it harder for trans kids to uh play sports and and all this kind of ridiculous like unserious shit so i think of course she has no morals she has no conviction she's into the limelight she's about building her brand she's about clout chasing it's about influence it's about spotlight for her at this point right i think that she knows that she's triangulated on that like same crosshairs of uh the joe rogan crowd right and she can play up the fact that she was military and she's connected to these special forces guys which is hilarious to in one breath do that and then be like oh also i'm the anti-war person uh they tend to do that it's like oh listen to this former spook talk about why the cia is bad and it's like bro he's not going to tell you they're bad for the reasons we think they're bad he's going to tell you that they're bad because they're not funding enough shit oh well we really we got sloppy on honduras and that's why all the public knows about it it's like what are you talking about dude no it's fucking we went and killed a bunch of people and installed 
called a brutal dictator and that was never going to happen in a good way like the, there was no clean and efficient way to do that like you know what i'm saying so anyway speaking of joe rogan i know we might segue into him later but i thought we had to get in the crosshairs of this and and people will always say oh you know what's great about joe rogan is that he's apolitical what's great about joe rogan is that he's you know he's just as much of a lefty as he is into right wing you know he just makes up his mind about shit and what i love about that is like you can really see like people when their pants are down when the when there's no not supposed to be phones at the comedy club in, in austin texas that uh, joe rogan built just so he wouldn't ever get his feelings hurt uh tucker motherfucking carlson crowd goes wild for tucker joining comedy stage with joe rogan according to the daily caller daily caller co-founder tucker carlson received huge applause after joining podcast host joe rogan on stage for a comedy show monday night they joined the live recording of a weekly comedy podcast kill tony which judges a handful of up-and-coming comics who each perform for 60 seconds at rogan's comedy mothership club you should go Austin, participate Texas. bro <laughs> i know dude i should get up there and what what will i say i'll be I, oh I've got the perfect, I've got my perfect stand up bit for them. But they'd be like, you know, you can't do comedy like you used to, man. It's true. You know, you can't do comedy like you used to in this country, bro. And, it, and it's just because of the woke mob. And then they'll start cheering thunderously. And I'll say, yeah. And it's about them. And it's about those people. And they'll be like, yeah. Yeah. And they'll say, it's because of the transgenders. And they'll be like, and then they'll be shitting their pants, dude. There will be foam coming out of their mouths. And then I'll just raise my middle finger in the air and say, I will die for America. And then these motherfuckers will just start taking off their clothes and rolling around like hogs in mud. And then, I don't know, man, but I'm sure there's a way to capitalize off that financially. Yeah, dude. I think you'd be a huge hit at the, what was it, Kill Tony circle or whatever. <laughs> it's, uh, it's at the Joe Rogan Comedy Mothership Club. <laughs> Could you imagine uh, being just so insecure? That's the thing about Joe Rogan is I'm like, I, in some ways I can relate to him because we're both short. And I'm like, I get it, dude. You got to live your whole life. You got to be really successful if you're a short person, right? Because you spend your whole life being like, God damn it. I wish I was 6'5". I wish I was 6'5". Until you're on an airplane and then you can enjoy yourself for a little bit, a little bit more than everybody else. But anyway. <sighs> yeah. Did, did you see the clip of Rogan debating Coleman Hughes on Israel? Uh, I knew that that happened and I saw a couple of people that we know that made videos like Joe Rogan pushes back and I was like, you know what? I'll give him credit. If this dude hits a, you know, hits a bunt walk to first base, I'll give him credit for it. I'll clap from the stands. Yeah, let's take a quick look here. I thought this was an interesting exchange. I don't know much about Coleman Hughes, but I thought that his defense of Israel was uh, pretty sickening here and even Joe Rogan kind of calls him out for you know, being fairly cold in his analysis. So let's take a look, a quick look here. If you ask the question, what is unique about this war? What is different about this war than all other, other wars? It's, it's not the civilian death toll. The, the ratio of combatants to civilians is, I think it's better than the American armies was when we got mm -hmm. ISIS out of Mosul. That was like 10,000 civilians dead to kill 4,000 ISIS. This is 19,000 civilians dead to kill 13,000. Um, it's not, uh, it's, it's not that, you know, the, the, what's, what's unique about this war, unlike every other war that I could think of, is, is you have a, an army in Hamas that has perfected the art of embedding itself and meshing itself with civilians so that you cannot hit them without hitting the people around them. Other armies have done this, but none have perfected it to the extent that Hamas has. No army that I know of in, in military history has had 15 years to build 300 miles of tunnel underneath a city that they don't use to shelter the civilians, but they use to shelter themselves so that they can operate right under the kindergarten, right under a mosque. So this is a challenge no army has faced. And so that, that's what makes this war different. And, and yes, the, the, I agree with all of the, the absolute tragedy and suffering of the Palestinian people, but it's what, what creates that is the way Hamas fights. And either we can say one of two things. We can either say, well, Israel just, Israel doesn't have a clean shot. And so they have to let Hamas get away with it because it's too much to bear. Um, but then we are essentially creating a situation where terrorists have found the perfect solution, which is that you can cross the border, go house to house slaughtering your enemies, <laughs> and then hide behind your own people and they can do nothing about it. It's a perfect strategy. That's literally what Israel does. Hold on, hold on, pause that and play it back one more time. It, it, that is exactly what Israel has done. Play that right one more time. Solution, which is that you can cross the border, go house to house slaughtering your enemies, and then hide behind your own people and they can do nothing about it. It's a perfect strategy. That's and literally in a world called the West Bank. Yeah. That's Straight exactly up. what happened there. <laughs> we allow that to be an acceptable strategy. I don't think so. And it's very, it's very ugly to watch 
it's it's heartbreaking and i completely understand why people don't think the way i think when they see the videos i completely get it but i don't think we can actually live in a world where that's allowed to be a, a strategy i appreciate your perspective oh what the fuck that this was great perspective joe <laughs> i really appreciate that uh perspective uh you know that was good question. stuff what is you thanks bro <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, he does push back a bit. Um, I don't know where the clip is That's right exactly now. That's exactly what I expected from Joe Rogan while we're on it. Well, you see, man, I hear what you're saying, but like, I also see like the piles of dead children. I'm like, I don't know, it's fifty fifty. I hear you, bro. I think you're a good man. I think you're a good man, bro. It's like Joe Rogan is. Im- it's Im- unless you're about to take his weed away. You're just. He's just like he. he it's impossible to trigger him. The only time I've ever seen him get triggered by a right winger was when Steven Crowder went on there and looked like a fucking idiot uh, debating weed. Um, mm-hmm. and that was like a decade ago. Yeah, you can't forget the uh, other iconic moment where he kind oh, of Adam embarrassed ruins everything. Oh no! Well, that too. Um, I was going to actually, you know, reference the time where he embarrassed Candace Owens when she tried to deny climate change on his podcast. Uh, fair enough. And he was like, "Well, this study says like ninety nine point eight percent of scientists agree that you know climate change is real." And yeah, that was like it's it's honestly crazy that Candace Owens ever came back from that. It was such an embarrassing start to her career, her first like big interview on a platform like that. Total belly flop, but. She didn't go anywhere. That's proof, guys, that no matter how embarrassed Honestly, you thank get, God, she Shane can still and all the vice guys came on and taught Joe Rogan about climate change. <laughs> Did they? I didn't know that. <laughs> that early on in the show, this was one of the, this is how I became a Joe Rogan fan, guys. It, it like not anymore. I don't listen to it anymore. But right around like Joe Rogan, like like it had been a while that it had been on. This is probably like Joe Rogan, like seven fifty, uh, that I would have started tuning in, and then I went back and listened to a bunch of the back catalog. But this was when he was having Shane Smith, Eddie Wong, like interesting guys from the Vice reporting world were on there, and then he would just also get like these weird fuckers that would just make up weird conspiracy theories about like go back like Tepe and how like actually maybe man had already lived and discovered all this shit, and what did we lose in the library of all? The- anyway it was fun to get stoned and listen to that shit sometimes right like that was where he operated in my brain and then he just started to balloon and then when the public consciousness exploded around him in like 2016 it was super weird because he'd been operating at such a huge level uh with just a fan base that had arisen organically and then he just went off the deep end he went like right wing worm brain um he was like i'm done flirting with the left they're always mean to me anyway and it's like bro the left is mean to everybody. That's that's how we get through the you know prolonged suffering and the fact that we never win. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Anyway, uh, th- there's a there's the update on Joe Rogan. Yeah, and Graham. Co- I also love the Grand Hancock episodes. That that's the kind of conspiracy shit I can get down with because it's like you know if it if it turns out to be total bullshit, who cares, right? There's not like some terrible effect it's going to have on society and the you know. 20% of the population is unvaccinated now because of these conspiracy theories. It's like, it's nothing like that. You know, you either believe it and think it's fun and interesting or you don't and you go about your life as a normal person. But yeah, I do. I do like the ancient aliens, Gobekli Tepe kind of stuff. That's, you know, the Bigfoot stuff, the alien stuff. That's that's definitely my favorite aspect of the Joe Rogan well, experience. Just like taking DMT and them like yep. spinning a bunch of yarn with like, uh, what's that guy's name? Uh, that dude that wrote... Uh, Oh shit! The book about polyamory that everybody reads. Uh, shit. Me and Felisa both read right. that. The uh, Sex at Dawn or whatever. Sex at Dawn. Yeah. What's that guy's name? Christopher something. Uh, I read that forever ago. Uh, yeah. it was like really making a moment. Uh, gosh. Uh, Christopher Ryan. There we go. That was mm-hmm. that guy's name. I was going to drive me crazy, but like Duncan Trussell and him and Joe Rogan would always sit on the podcast and they would talk about like psychedelics and like trippy shit, like weird thoughts that they had when they'd done DMT together. And it was funny and it was just like a dude, bro, kind of like, you know, basement pod. The more he gets into politics and the more that it tries to be a serious production, the more it's lost me. Like the best moment was when it was big enough that like people who were famous wanted to go on there, but it wasn't sold out to Spotify. It was like a weird apex where he was like, oh yeah, he's talking to Rob Zombie and Quentin Tarantino, but like it's still the same show mostly. And then after that, it was fucking over. Yep. Yep. As soon as the Spotify shit and then the vaccine shit hit, it was just like all over. And then the trans obsession, which had already yep. always kind of been there, but then it just got ballooned so much. It got yeah. ballooned so much. I'm like, why is this all you fucking talk about? Yeah, it really did just kind of turn into like the slightly edgier version of Bill Maher for a second there. Um, and I guess it still is. But anyway, do you want to segue into talking a bit about this Destiny beef with Brianna and uh, good old Sounds Storm like and Norman? Sounds like a boy's name. <laughs> yeah, dude. So 
I guess that Norm Finkelstein went on the Bad Faith podcast, as he is known to do, a couple days ago. Um, here's a clip of them talking about Marion Williamson. Um, so let's let's uh, react to this because I actually haven't seen this one yet. I'm interested in Norm's response to Marianne, and then we'll get into Destiny's response to this because it was pretty intense, pretty vicious. I'm shocked that Destiny would be rational and <laughs> you know low key. You, you then ask what was the right question to ask? Be specific. What is it that you object to specifically in what, how he characterizes you? So I was waiting for her to say, well, what he says about my views on Israel Palestine, blah, blah, blah. She never said. I listened to it and I listened to it again. No, she never said. When I hear yeah, her, I think that's right. I think her objection is more to the idea of being kind of dismissed as a person worth considering or being dismissed as opposed to for her views, almost as though you're not even getting to my views because you're prematurely. Did I treat destiny better? Dismissive. Have I? Spoken? Well, I, I mean, I don't know if that's entirely fair, Norm, because I, I wouldn't say that I would put destiny and Marianne Williamson okay, in the Sam, same category. Sam Harris. I've written on Sam Harris. Did I treat him better? I said he's an imbecile. I, I mean, I don't know. I'm not familiar with <laughs> okay. um, your debate with Sam Harris. So I've, written, you... I've written on it. Then she okay. I, I look. Well, well, let me say this, Norm. I think that you treated Candace Owens better. I think you treated uh, Jordan Peterson's Ooh. daughter better. Oh, and I'll tell you why. Spicy pushback, Here's Bree. Question, and I'll tell you why. I try to be consistent. You know why? Because Candace Owens began the interview by saying, I don't know anything about this subject. I'm just going to have these people, I'm going to have two people on, one on one side, one on the other side. I really don't know anything about the subject. And I feel though I should... That is the best way to go into a conversation when the person you're debating just admits up front that they're a fucking moron that knows nothing and says, educate me, please. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's the one thing that Candace Owens can do well. He goes, I'll sit and, you know. No, I'm going to get canceled like Bosch, you know. <laughs> Have somebody on to talk about it, okay? I appreciate that humility. I think it's proper in, in the same way. I, I hear you, Norm, but Marianne, in all due respect, I, I cannot say enough times how much I disagree with her on Israel. You have, if you guys could have, be privy, she alluded to this when she was on, but if you could be privy to all of the conversation, all the heated arguments that we've had about this, it would that point would be made even more firmly. That being said, it wouldn't be right to say Mary Williamson does not know anything about this. She, she's not in the position of, of Candace Owens. She's someone who has beliefs and is holding on to ideas and what she thinks are the right facts and which I things that I disagree with. So did Norm take shots at Marianne? Was that something that had happened already? Yes, because uh, I guess he went on the Bad Faith maybe a couple months ago or perhaps another podcast, and he was just not impressed with Marianne Williamson, specifically her takes on Israel. I think he called her an imbecile and you know said, like, why don't you just keep your mouth shut on this subject or something like that? It was, it was pretty brutal, right? Very, um, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I, I also do disagree with a, a fair bit of what Marianne has said about Israel. Um, she seems to, you know, yeah, she seems to be a little bit more uh, easy on the concept of Israel than than a lot of her counterparts on the left. Um, but I, I still do agree with Brianna that she deserves to be taken more seriously than someone like Candace Owens, who, while Candace may have... Just know, a deranged anti-Semite. Yeah, exactly. Who was, I think, by Norm's own admission on our podcast... Candace really only had him on there to stick it to Ben Shapiro. Uh, she was like, I think Norm said that he was like, he was like, yeah. And in retrospect, she might've just had me on cause she knew it would really, you know, get under the skin of Ben, which obviously it did. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that Marion Williamson is obviously a more serious person when it comes to issues of foreign policy, war and peace than someone like Candace Owens. But that being said, I'm not I'm not here to pearl clutch about Norm Finkelstein, you know, uh, using whatever words he wants to describe people. That's one of my favorite things about Norm is his lack of a filter. And even when it comes to someone who I respect, like Marion Williamson, I understand, you know, Norm's frustration, uh, specifically given some of Marion's comments, which have been, you know, uh, pretty weird, I would say, over the last few months on this specific topic. Yeah.
Uh, I haven't followed Marianne's uh, positions on on Israel much since ten seven. I knew we were not going to have a, a lot of agreement there. The, when we waded into it with her, I was like, I don't, I don't really foresee us breaking ground uh, on this issue. So I just, I haven't looked into it. Uh, I don't, you know, uh, it hasn't, you know, come up for me a ton. But I imagine that there is a a, a, a meaningful gap. Uh, between where and her, her and Norm Finkelstein are, given the fact that I know there's a meaningful gap between where she is and you know my politics are, uh, so that would make sense. But yeah, you know, for me, it's just it's really hard. like uh, Marianne's a sweet lady. Like I'm like, you know, I get why she's offended by that. I'm like, oh, you know, I try and like, like I'll talk shit, right? I, I have no people in glass houses can't throw stones, right? But there are times where I try and be respectful to people who I'm like, well. You know, like normal, it's like you guys were, you looked afraid when you were talking. I was like, well, I was trying to be respectful to you, bro, uh, because I I, I, uh, I was afraid. Uh, I did not want to piss him off and not know how to respond. Uh, but that, I mean, that's kind of how I, I'm afraid of most people who are over the age of 65. Like, I don't know how to put that nicely, but they've never liked me. Like, once you get to that age 65, it's like there's a steep decline on people who like Zach Polston. Okay. I've, my whole childhood, my whole life, old people never. I, I don't know what it is. I was always like, and this is, and I know there are a lot of uh, uh, people who might be older than 65 in our comment section. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about the ones that don't like me, right? And in my <laughs> real life, when I'm not Zach the podcaster, I'm just some shithead with hand tattoos walking along the street. They don't seem to like me then either. Okay. When I'm driving in my car and I honk, they don't seem to like me either. You know what I'm saying? So I'm just saying, I always, I'm like, ah, oh, I walk on eggshells a little bit. I'm like, all right, you know, you guys live before me you you know i'm not saying your generation's responsible for the state of our economy now but hey you know i'm kidding <laughs> yeah dude um so let's take a look at what destiny said and and we'll take a look at a few minutes of what he's referencing here because obviously the subject of the finkelstein debate or destiny debate came up in the bad faith discussion destiny uh, posts a screenshot of it here and says, I think it always says something about the confidence of a side if they're willing to talk about someone, but they're never willing to talk to someone. D uh, Norm, literally, he, he must have forgot. Destiny's not very bright. I don't know if he's doing some sort of electroshock therapy. I don't know if he's been, you know, indulging in, in some sort of ketamine usage in a way that's eroded his, you know, recent memory. I'm not here to judge him. I hope that he's happy. But what I will say is I do remember, just to act as a neutral party here, Norm and Destiny had a had a in-person exchange. So that that would be a little strange here. You know, you're a reporter and you're asking somebody about this per person that they in front of an audience of you know a million people or so at this point have seen that and you're like, oh yeah, let's talk about that. And then for you to be like, wow, that's so weird. Why did you ask him about this very high profile debate you did with <laughs> Lex Fridman's pod? Right. Yeah, it, it's pretty crazy. Um, I'm not sure if Destiny is is trying to uh, allude to the fact that maybe he's attempted to set up a debate with Brianna and maybe she's turned him down. But I personally struggle to see that being the case. I would I would be shocked if Brianna turned down a debate with Destiny, specifically on this subject matter. Like, I mean, Brianna's so good at debating. She seems to be perfectly comfortable debating um she seems to seek out high profile debates when they become available to her so i would i would genuinely be shocked if if brie turned down an opportunity to debate destiny on the subject matter um and i really hope she didn't honestly because i think it would be an absolutely amazing discussion probably one of the best israel palestine's uh debates that we could react to ever um because i think that brianna you know destiny would really meet his match next to brianna brianna is so good at debating this issue as you guys know from watching rising i mean how many times now has she just completely shut down her co-host robbie um in addition to uh, many other people who have crossed her path so you know despite some of my disagreements with brianna on other issues i do think she's one of the best when it comes to palestine and i think that if she did sit down with destiny that it would be a quite compelling conversation um so it's interesting that destiny's kind of acting like you know they're too scared to talk to him when obviously norm literally did talk to him for five hours and i imagine brianna would be happy to as well um and then he also uh quote tweets his own tweet saying this pod from brianna joy gray is unreal it reminds me of the debates on youtube in 2015 which is kind of weird um because in the video he links to they're not even debating they're just kind of roasting him but 
whatever. He says, she lies about my position several times, says I'd be okay nuking Gaza. And they don't bring up a single point of substantive disagreement in this conversation. Why? Uh, so yeah, do you got any comments on that, Zach, or should we just take a look at the oh, first yeah, few see minutes? here, I was actually going to pull this up just so that you can reference everybody the moment that uh, Brianna was referring to here. Go ahead and play this uh, with sound for you. I don't know if Jim Crow would have qualified for have a part of that. That doesn't make it any less. Verse, excuse me, Twinklestein. I'm talking right now. Verse, excuse me, verse. excuse me, Twinklestein. I'm talking to your friend over here. Um, I don't know if it would have qualified as the crime of apartheid. Just like if Israel were to literally nuke the Gaza Strip and kill two million people, I don't know if that would qualify for the crime of In genocide. Right. So that would that would be what she was referencing. I don't think it makes it, uh, Stephen, uh, Mr. Burinelli, uh look very good. But if he wants to use that as a fucking cudgel to defend himself, go ahead and pull that clip all you want, Stephen. <laughs> yeah exactly we all know what she was referencing there um but yeah let's take a look at some of this conversation between brie and norm they talk a little bit about the debate um and other stuff so we can take in a few minutes of this uh wildly offensive inaccurate unreal and uh unsubstantive conversation or whatever the hell destiny described it as um let's take a look we gotta say it made for great TV, Norm. Like honestly, I was cackling when when the when the show dropped. It was a Friday. I don't do Rising on Friday, so I was kind of lounging around in bed, and I was like, "Little clear my schedule. I will not be roused <laughs> for the next five hours or two and a half hours because I did double speed until I listened to every word of this, and it surpassed every expectation. Not just because of the drama and kind of the 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 hilarity of your obvious contempt for the lack of uh, intellectual rigor that Destiny brought to the debate, but also substantively, you know, both you and Muin Rabani were just so thorough and persuasive, and you each brought different things to the debate, different kind of um, attitudes that have had effect working, I think, in tandem to address the claims that were coming from the other side of the table, kind of different um, um, tonal modes that I think played well with each other, uh, kind of a good cop, bad cop, if you will. And it was so satisfying and so informative. And you say, okay, it doesn't have, have as much reach as um, going on mainstream news or that you haven't been invited on mainstream channels in the US, but there are millions of views on that video. Please don't tell and me that that's going to ruin <laughs> <laughs> See, he's going to turn into a star. Uh, we're gonna, we're, ne we're never going to be able to book uh, Norm Finkelstein again. And also, shout out to you, Kelly. Really appreciate the generous super chat. Destiny's beef with Norm is so ridiculous to keep listening to. Norm has better things to do than getting dragged into internet debate. Be I don't know if he does, man. I think this is a great use of Norm's time. I mean, sometimes you got to smack down. I mean, what's the use of reading for ten thousand hours or ten thousand books or however many books this guy's read on the issue of Palestine alone if you're not going to, you know, whip it out when it's the most critical to make the case to the public? Of course, Norm's not actually debating destiny that's why he treats him the way he does it's an it's an interesting approach but i think it's one that is worth unpacking instead of take like he's not interested in trying to convince destiny because destiny is not interested in learning the facts he's not interested in learning the realities of the situation he's not interested in you know changing his mind so what's norm doing he's making a mockery of his, all of his positions he's he's basically showing what a cartoon figure he is somebody without any intellectual rigor Right. And and that is his way of saying to the broader audience of people who might have once been a Destiny fan, no, this is not at all a charlatan or this is not a genius guy that has an answer to everything. I could easily make a mockery of him. He has no responses to the things that I'm saying. Uh, and I will treat him with the disdain that I feel like he deserves. That's I honestly I don't I don't know what else would Norm be doing right now. I, I mean, you know, he can do it all from the comfort of his own living room. Yeah, I actually, I totally agree with you, Zach. And I understand what you're saying, Kelly. Like, let's be clear. Uh, Destiny is certainly beneath Norm Finkelstein. That's that's why Norm treated him the way that he did. Um, but I don't think that it's a good idea either for academics or people of Norm's intellectual stature to just ignore uh, kind of online thought leaders and high profile commentators. Uh, because like, you know, whatever you feel about it, and most people online watching, they don't care if Destiny has a PhD or not. You know, it's not like they're taking him less seriously because he lacks the scholarly and intellectual rigor of someone like Norm Finkelstein. His 
audience believes everything he says for the most part. Um, they think he's incredibly intelligent. They think he's incredibly well read. They think he's a you know very uh, intimidating intellectual figure. Whatever, right? So Norm needs to understand that as he does, and you know deal with it accordingly. That's why he engages with people like Destiny. In the same way, he'll go on you know Piers Morgan show to debate him and Rabbi Shmuley or something, right? Like you have to talk to everyone, and not everyone is watching Piers Morgan. A lot of people, especially from younger generations, they are going to be getting their news from Destiny. Like I have a friend. Uh, Dalton, who loves Destiny, like almost exclusively watches Destiny, and and Dalton, genuinely, no, I know. <laughs> I've spent many hours trying to change his mind. Shout out to my homie Dalton. Shout out to the homie. Dalton. <laughs> <laughs> if we ever debate Destiny, I'm going to feel so well prepared because I've already like shadow boxed him like a hundred times. Um, <laughs> but yeah, shout out to you, Kelly. I do think it's a I do think it's a good move for Norm Finkelstein to stay relevant, um, and you know, more importantly, for his ideas to stay relevant and to you know remain embedded in the discourse for him to engage with people like Destiny. But I, I understand what you're saying, man. I understand how you could you know be like why are you wasting your time with this um but either way shout out to you man and uh, also shout out to you hysteric creator mr spaghetti really needs to take a break <laughs> yeah dude destiny has been he's been going hard i'm not really sure why he thought it was a good idea to brand himself as like one of the biggest you know israel defenders definitely a weird move for a liberal to make even when it feels like most liberals at this point like a freaking beta o'rourke is out here calling for a ceasefire and saying to like vote uncommitted and stuff and you're and and you're uh to the right of him like jesus christ bro this is it's not a good look but you know it's, it's it is what it is that's his beat i guess yeah it is what it is you know hey content's content and we're here to mind it just like everyone else right you know mr spaghetti or norm finkelstein uh and shout out to you sabrina lee just found your channel last week and click the subscribe button keep up the great commentary yo shout out to you sabrina really appreciate that uh, it's rare that new people find this podcast, but it's even more rare that when they find it, they enjoy it. So thank you so much for hitting the subscribe button. <laughs> yeah. Shout out to you, Sabrina. Thank you so much for the super chat. Uh, welcome to the channel. Hope you continue to enjoy our commentary. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much for subscribing. And if anyone else is just tuning in, you know, for the first time or maybe not subscribed yet, uh, feel free to join our community as well. We always have a great time chatting. Uh, but yeah, shout out to you, Sabrina. And let's watch a bit more of this before we move on. And of views on that video. There are millions of views on your interviews with like um, Jordan Peterson's daughter and Candace Owens. And remember that CNN only gets, what, like 500,000 views on a primetime airing? Well, I have to tell you, Marie, who I love to death, I've known her for 30 years. We met in the early 1980s. <clears throat> we had a fundamental clash over what you call tonal mode. <laughs> because Marie said, I am going to speak not to them, but to the broader, broader audience and enlighten them in the facts and just ignore the two people, other people in the room. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, maybe you're going to do that for me. But I am taking my <laughs> Okay, I have no idea what the fuck they're talking about right now. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if, if, if there was another timestamp that we want to jump to, but I'm, I'm listening to this and I'm like, uh, I am not deciphering what's going on right now. Sorry, this chat. Is, this is what triggered Destiny. <laughs> Ah, uh, yes, he couldn't. He couldn't. He left his joy. That was what it was. He was like, "Wow, he couldn't see. Uh, he couldn't deal with the the you know the ge multi generational lefties you know coming together." Um, but uh, one thing that I I guess we could discuss, Gavin, just because it's you know we have I'm not in a rush to get out of here. Uh, what do you think about this? I think this is, I mean, probably going to be like a, more of an MSNBC story than something that we would normally talk about on our podcast, but. I mean, the gun crisis in this country continues oh, to unfold. Yeah, these are the parents who let their kids get their ha hands on the gun and then they shot up some shit, right? Yeah, the Michigan school shooter, it was the kid. That kid's yeah. already been sentenced. Uh, I think he's doing life, but his parents were also uh, sentenced to uh, you know 10 to 15 years. I think the father uh, got a different sentence than the mom. 
Uh, so two, two parents of Michigan school shooters have each been sentenced to 10 and 15 years in prison for the role in the attack that killed four students in 2021. Jennifer and James Crumbly appeared in court on Tuesday as the first parents convicted in an American mass school shooting during their trials. Prosecutors said tragically simple actions by both parents could have stopped the catastrophe. The Crumblies did not know their son, Ethan Crumbly, was planning a shooting at Oxford High School. But prosecutors said, sorry, not to make light of this horrific story, but... <laughs> Uh, yeah, hit their son, 17, now uh, pleaded guilty to serving a life sentence. The couple had separate trials. Uh, he had drawn a gun, a bullet, and a gunshot victim on a math assignment, accompanied by grim phrases, the thoughts won't stop, help me, my life is useless, blood everywhere. So, I mean, clearly negligence by the parents. And I think that at some point, like, um, it's, it's a multi-pronged problem in this country. Like, I don't think imprisoning parents is the solution to mass gun violence obviously right um maybe it, it would be because I, I just think that in a country where there are millions and millions of guns in circulation that if you want to fucking find one and kill somebody then there are going to be options for you too uh, but i think that the reason why i'm kind of pro sentencing parents when it comes to things like this is because that kid was a minor that kid was like you know 14 15 years old when he did this shit right and you, you see him you know cry, crying out for help you're like still responsible for that individual as a parent and when you give them a fucking gun right you give a kid a hammer he's gonna look for fucking nails you know what i mean so it's almost like you facilitated this it's like when the cia uh will like lead you to commit a bunch of crimes and it's called entrapment right uh, it's almost like he was entrapped. It was like, yeah, hey, you're fucked up. Hey, your brain's not working. Hey, we're ignoring you. It's like the kid from the Pearl Jam song, you know? Daddy didn't give attention. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's like that exact same story time after time after time. Uh, do you think this will, you know, I don't know. It's weird because we don't really see a trend that sentencing disincentivizes crime, but do you think this is a step in the right direction at all, or do you think it's just pissing in the wind? Oh, I think it's definitely a step in the right direction, 100%. I think that, you know, we have this culture in America where guns are just taken for granted and they're just such a part of our society that they just straight up don't get taken as seriously as they should have, which over and over again leads to these sorts of incidents. But I'll remind everyone that parents like fairly routinely get charged for neglect if they like leave uh, like I, I read a story about a parent who like left a bunch of like weed brownies out and then their kid like ate them and got high as fuck they had to take it to the hospital and then the parents actually ended up getting charged for neglect uh because they just left these products that were you know clearly for adults out in the open um leading to their child you know getting massively intoxicated and potentially you know luckily not but potentially could have had like health complications or something um so they got charged this seems to be even more obvious to me like yeah if you're gonna uh, let your kid have access to a fucking firearm something with the capacity to kill multiple multiple people um then yeah you, you need to be taking that a lot more seriously as a parent you need to make sure that shit's locked up uh that it's not loaded um that you teach your kid how to you know respect this uh weapon whatever you want to call it right if you're gonna have choose to have that in your house at all um which is already a you know a bit of a weird decision but it is what it is it's a free country obviously you can own a gun if you want um but yeah i just think it's madness if you're gonna have a kid let alone a fucking depressed hormonal kid that's going through shit um yeah of course this is the correct ruling and i think that it should you know hopefully set a precedent and, and make people pay more attention to the way that they're uh raising their their children if there's firearms in the house yeah for sure and and you know i'll give the you know the disclaimer for people like my father out there who they're like you know gun owners and it's like they keep the fucking guns locked up in the fucking you know safe and it's a big deal and all that shit i'm not saying that there's no responsible gun ownership in this country and i think that's a point that a lot of lefties miss right obviously for reasons that i massively disagree with and i think are a lot of the sources of problems for this nation uh we worship fucking guns like you know there's the scene and they live where the money where you puts on the sunglasses and the money says this is your god yeah well if you saw a gun they would say this is your holy cross you know what i'm saying like it is just that integral to american society they worship 
fucking guns because to them it represents some element of security which in every other facet has been taken away from them now do i think it's for the birds do i think it's pissing in the wind of course absolutely i tell my dad all the time i'm like yeah you were in the u.s government you think you and your fucking front yard are gonna take them down he's like obviously not i'm like exactly i rest my fucking case it's about it's taking as many down on the way that's out exactly possible. what this crazy son of a bitch told me the last time i talked to him about that for anybody who wants to take my father's fucking advice in the chat um <laughs> Hey, that's exactly what I was like. That you're on a list now. You're on a list somewhere. Uh, you know, like and, and you know, and then there's all the crazy people that are like burying pipes everywhere in their yard because Obama was going to take their guns. Yeah, I guess what you still have them, pal. Uh, but we have to do something, right? We have to do something that pro that that creates a barrier from these fucking kids getting killed all the time, right? I remember I was listening again, not to take this back to sports podcast, but that's what I like to watch when I'm not working. I read the news. I don't watch a ton of podcasts unless we're looking for content for the show. Right. But what I do watch is a shit ton of sports uh, podcasts. And those are always decidedly apolitical. Like they will not touch politics on all the road all those shows because it's bad for their bottom line they want republicans and democrats listening to their sports show right but they were talking about mass shootings and the guy was like when we were because they were at the mass shooting at the uh, chiefs parade and they were like the people who knew what to do the people who were acting the most calmly and the most rationally were the kids who had recently been trained and put through a bunch of courses in class and how to survive a mass shooting that's so because dark. that's the state of our public school system in this country that's the state of what it's like to be a kid that goes to school every day and have to walk through the fucking sense and it was like oh yeah that's the kind of horror that we're forced to live. so we gotta you gotta fucking do something about this you know what i mean we have to make a a change as a country i think this is a much smaller of a change than i would like i think that it's you know it doesn't bring those kids back it's not prevention to uh you know put these parents in jail uh but i do think that it starts a good conversation that the rep the parents are fucking responsible for you if you you know if if you go out and your kid you know commits a horrible crime like that with the gun that you bought him i mean fuck if i gave gavin a gun and he goes and kills somebody i'm going to jail you know what i mean like i'm just saying right like that would be how that would work if i go out and i give my little brother a gun and he goes and he puts a bullet in somebody's fucking head uh then and I would also be up on the fucking chopping block, right? You, I, you'd be trying to find me in the fucking, you know, jungles of Colombia or something. It would be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, I actually think it's kind of crazy that this is the first time parents have ever been charged and convicted in their child's mass shooting. Um, obviously, if the kid, you know, gets the gun on the dark web or something or buys it from a friend that the parent had no control over whatsoever, that's one thing. Obviously, you can't just, you know, hold parents responsible for everything their shithead kid does. Uh, but it seems like a lot of the situations are exactly like this, where the kid has either literally been given the gun by his parents or he took a gun from his parents that was not well secured. I've, I've read a lot of stories about that and not even just with mass shooting sometimes with just pure accidents where it's like, you know, three kids they find their, uh, one of their dad's guns and then they're all just like, you know, horsing around in the shed out back and oops, bam, one of them is now dead, right? It's like in that instance I, I absolutely think the parents should be charged as well because obviously these kids had no business handling firearms. They didn't know what the hell they were doing. They just were, you know, playing. They're stupid. Um, and then, you know, one of them is dead because you didn't practice responsible gun ownership i know i sound like a freaking boy scout troop leader right now um but it's true like these are fucking weapons of mass destruction you can't just have them laying on the living room table yeah exactly and technically they're not weapons of mass destruction that would be a <laughs> nuclear bomb but yes i hear what you're, i hear what you're saying these are deadly weapons these yeah. are these are bad things uh, and, and, you know, people are always like, oh, that's for putting food on the table. It's like, motherfucker, you live in downtown Kansas City. <laughs> Yeah, where, where the fuck you shooting fucking little critters when you walk home and geese Park? on the like, side of the road? Yeah, I'm like, I'm like, excuse me, sir, ain't any hunting around her? Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. I'm just like, it's uh huh. Yeah. Anyway, pretty, and, then the, and my fucking least favorite thing is I just to get out all of my like fucking gun arguments, right? We're on the topic. We're about to get into abortion, so it's going to be such a fun fucking rest of the podcast, but. You know, people always say, look, Chicago has the strictest gun laws in America and, then, and they have so much gun violence. And to those people, I would like to show you a map of America. And I want you to see that Chicago is not an island. It actually is a city that's directly in the middle of this motherfucker. OK, that was why people liked it. That was how it became a big 
hub. Okay. And it happens to be right next to Indiana. You can throw a rock from Chicago and get to Indiana. And guess what the gun laws are like over there? Oh, laxer than fuck. Yeah. And you can go to a gun show and you can buy yourself fucking guns and you can sell them to some, you know, kids in Chicago for three times what you sent over there. And hey, now we have racketeering, right? This is America after all. That's an enterprise. That's how it's going to fucking foster. So that's what we have to clean up. Uh, if we want to get all, uh, if we, you know, we want to get, stop these guns from getting into kids fucking hands in Missouri. It's easy as shit to buy a gun. It's easy as shit to buy a gun. I'm alarmed by the fact every time like i know people that have guns like you know people even people who are our age and it always i'm like i'm like you have a fucking gun dude and they'll be like yeah just in case some shit happens I'm we like, should get you? some guns to put in our background like destiny, yeah, like destiny. <laughs> yeah dude it makes me extremely <laughs> scared that like the like when i like when my homie like he bought a gun legally and, and he had it and i was like bro get that shit away from me dude i don't fucking want to be here if you have that shit out dude fuck you like this is crazy he was like what dude it's a fucking gun like hey well, it's not gonna hurt you it's in the fucking case and i was like no, i don't <laughs> I'm getting the fuck out of here, bro. He's like, it's legal in Missouri. I was like, mm -mm, I don't fuck with that. Yeah, dude. I remember one time back in like high school, I was hanging out at this one guy's house who I think sold a lot of weed. And at one point in the conversation, I was high as shit. And he just starts telling me about how he has like multiple guns in his closet, like machine, like AK 47s and shit. And I got the fuck out of there real quick. I just got so uncomfortable. I'm like, oh God, like obviously nothing was going to happen, but I was just so high. And he was like, yeah, bro, I got to, I got to have that to defend myself. And I'm like, and it's young kids. It's always young kids. Dude. Oh, yeah. it's, this it's guy like, was like 22. Exactly. My little brother, he's like, what? He'll be 20 this year or some shit like that. And I, he was telling me like maybe six months ago, oh, my friend's going to go to jail because he got caught with a gun and a bunch of fucking weed in the scale. And I'm like, oh, you mean involved in a fucking crime that will obviously <laughs> carry charges? Like, you know, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> fucking crazy that if you move mass amounts of weight and have guns in your crib and the cops come over, it ain't fucking good for you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's something that you learn to think about a little more when you're 26, 27 you're like wait maybe i won't do that because i don't want to go in a you know six by eight cell for the rest of my fucking life yeah totally also shout out to you ron well thank you for gifting the one vanguard membership some comrade just got a, a free vanguard membership so thank you so much ron well and another one from you just did it to celebrate cody's win at wrestlemania 40 shout out to you bro keeping us updated on the all things wrestlemania yeah, shout out to you, Ron. Well, really appreciate that from you. And uh, what's the deal with Miami of Canada, Chicago? Do people hey, call Chicago that? <laughs> hey, bro, if it's the Miami of Canada, bro, it's the windy city. I love Chicago. We were talking about Same. this the other day. I don't think I, I don't know if I'll plan to live in Chicago again, but in the springtime, it's one of my favorite cities to go visit, man. It's great. Food's awesome. People are awesome. You can get around real easy. It's like a 40 minute flight from KC. So it's great for going for like a weekend or three days, uh, man. It's awesome. Well, so there's great festivals every year. I feel like they get a lot of good music that comes through Chicago and we get dog shit for music that comes in Casey. So you got to travel for it. Yep. Yep. Shout out to you, Libra Vision Network. That's hilarious. I've, I've literally never heard Chicago referred to as the Miami of Canada. Um, but yeah, I guess if you live in Canada, that, that probably would be like the closest, like big, big city that you could visit in America. So I guess that kind of makes sense. Um, you shout know, out to you, man. You just go to Montreal. Well, if you want to go to like a more American, you know, city, I guess, where Toronto. the real partying happens. Yeah, they don't want to go to Buffalo. I've been to Buffalo. <laughs> Buffalo's not bad. I wouldn't go back there. It feels like the Kansas City of the Northeast, though. So I got to like, true, I gotta, like a camaraderie with them. I'm like, I see why you guys like it here. Uh, too bad your football team sucks and you missed your window with Josh Allen. But hey, I'm not here to point fingers and laugh. <laughs> I remember I, back in the day, like... 10, 15 years ago or something, I when uh, I was in Buffalo with my family, I ate at the original restaurant where like Buffalo wings were invented. Have you ever been there? Oh, I went there too. Yeah, dude. I think that you have to go there. It's like against yep. the law if you visit Buffalo <laughs> and you don't go there in Niagara Falls. Those are the two things. Everybody. Niagara Falls also, I don't know if I was just the like like shithead teenager that was on vacation and not impressed by anything but i remember being there and i also know the sequence from the office it looks just like that and then you're there and you're like i'm getting wet it's kind of cold outside and it's a fucking waterfall okay i've seen way more impressive waterfalls guys like maybe not as big but way more beautiful way more beautiful let me tell you what even really? in america i'm not even going to be like oh in thailand i saw this gorgeous jungle like are you kidding me bro some of the massive waterfalls that we have when you go hiking in this country that are actually in nature that actually like you know 
when you're in Utah and they have those like reserves and they like fucking pour water down and it's like red rock everywhere. And then, yeah, it's a lake with a waterfall and you can't even, you know, you have to go all the way to the other. You can either be up on top of the waterfall or you can be really far away from it. I'm like, all right, this is like, if this is the best Buffalo has to offer, I'd rather go to the casino while I'm here instead. Uh, you know. Yeah, I, I, I was also pretty unimpressed by Niagara Falls, but I was like eight, like seven or eight, like uh, according to my parents better with age, bro, when we were there. A bottle of wine. Yeah, may, I I don't know. I feel like if I did go back now, I'd be like, this would be amazing. Like this would be like astounding or something. When I was like, well, wow, I spent twelve hundred dollars to get here, and this is all I'm fucking looking at. Are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm not planning a trip up there or anything. That's what I'm saying. But... Exactly, exactly. You know what I'm saying? If I was like Gavin, let's go to Seattle, you'd be like, oh, word, all right, fuck yeah. If I was like, let's go to Buffalo, New York, and see Niagara Falls, you'd be like, why, dude? Or did somebody paying us to go there? Are we doing a spot up there? Like, what what are we doing? <laughs> We're gonna ride the barrels down the falls, bro. People used to do that apparently. One dude survived it. One dude survived yeah, it. Like, how the fuck? Tell you all about it. I remember <laughs> when I was at Niagara Falls. Anyway, <laughs> up to like the fucking waterfall continent. You were over here, bro. I like to hike. Leave me alone. I just, you don't judge me because I'm from Kansas City. I travel, <laughs> I get around the block. You know? uh-huh. Now, speaking of, did you see the eclipse yesterday, Zach? I've seen, I see, I see, here's the other thing. You guys are going to hate me. I'm sorry. I'm no fun. <laughs> I, I've seen an eclipse before. I went to Atchison, Kansas, uh, like five and a half years ago. So I saw the eclipse. Here's what you're looking at. Fucker. I don't, I, I don't believe any of you that you actually are that impressed by this for one. Uh, yeah. You're wearing your like little dogs and you get to see like a little bit. Like, Whoa. No, it's fucking bullshit. It looks like a penny that got covered up by a piece of paper. And that's it. And you're like, wow, I came outside. I traveled all this way. People being like, I drove a thousand miles to see this once in a lifetime spectacle. I'm like, one, I've lived through a couple of those already. And I'm, I don't care. They're not that interesting. The traffic is really fucking bad when you try and go see one. I literally, everybody was looking at me like I'm crazy because all my neighbors have lawn chairs out. So Lisa's outside with our dog. And she's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, oh, I'm getting in the shower. I just got done at the gym. Like, I'm fucking, I don't give a shit about this. Like, I'm not going to pretend that I do. Well, like, she's like, it just only happens every while. I'm like, fuck that. I don't <laughs> care. <laughs> yeah. I, I will say when it happened like six years ago and we were in the path of full totality, I did think that was pretty that was cool. That my first day at UMKC. Dude, me too. I think, or not me too, but it was my first day of that like semester. It was like the and first it was day the of the sophomore year because that was yeah. the first year I started going there. Yeah. And I remember I drove with my sister and my dad out to, I forget you know, Harrisonville, Missouri or some shit like that, where it was a hundred percent totality. And it it was, it was pretty cool. It was definitely, you know, kind of trippy. Um, it's a weird vibe when it's in the middle of the day and it gets dark and then, you know, like the, the animals start acting weird and sh- it's kind of a trippy vibe. And if you think about it, like back in the day, people thought the world was ending and stuff when that would happen. So like, you know, it's kind of it like the Niagara Falls really thing. Are. okay I, I like i said i was in the 100 percent genuine we took a family ass trip with my mom and my stepdad that i fucking hated and we all have to caravan in this car up to atchison kansas and you get out and everybody's bitching and moaning at each other for hours because it's hot outside and you're in fucking atchison kansas so there's not fuck all to do and you're like oh, okay we're staying in this like random ass house that my mom's friend owned for some reason and i'm like all right it's gonna be sick it's gonna be awesome we're all here at least it's gonna be tight <sighs> It's like 30 seconds, dude. All right. It, 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 it's like you spend your whole life and you're like, oh, man, I'll, well, you know, you know, anyway, I was yeah. going to joke about fucking a chick, but that, that seemed to <laughs> poor taste, you know? Yeah. When I saw it in, uh, what was that? 2016 or 2017 or whatever. 2017. There was like a bunch of people that were super into astronomy where I, I went to see it. Cause like my dad knew this guy that worked at the college. who's like an astronomer. So everyone there was like, so freaking dialed in. They were like, this is the most incredible astronomical event like this only you know all this crap so they they seemed really excited by it it was pretty infectious but i i get what you're saying it's not like you know it's i I don't understand why people travel like you know they they caravan like 36 hours into brazil to see it or what it's like it's not that big no dude and also (laughs) if it's overcast outside you're fucked you're sol yeah that is also true <laughs> so, you know try again i'm just like come on pe- people are so easily conned into hype i'm like mm, i used to be like that i used to be a child i used to when i was 18 i also would get wrapped up into hype right <laughs> oh yeah dude i want to go do this thing that's hyped dude i want to go where all the other people are i want to be a part of this and now i o- i'm older and i think for myself a little bit more not perfectly but a little bit more and i'm like oh everybody is really obsessed with this thing that's dumb as rocks yeah that's cool i i'll rather just have this 30 minutes to myself nobody's fucking with me i'll be you know in my bedroom hanging out reading or scrolling reddit 
<laughs> yeah, dude, you showed them all those sheeple out in those exactly. on the lawn you know, chairs. Sometimes it takes sometimes it takes a leader, Gavin. You know, sometimes you know we're building a religion. You know, we're building it bigger, widening the corridors, adding more lanes. I swear to God, I found out it's only like eighteen grand to get the rights to that song. So forever, Hassan Piker, you guys are listening to that at the beginning and end of every Vanguard episode. Eighteen grand. I'm like, mm, by the time I'm forty, I think I can get that song because I'm hoping that the value of a cake song depreciates and my interest in it will only it go will. up over time as it gets more <laughs> obscure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I think we had a couple other stories to talk about. Zach, is there anything specifically you wanted to segue into? Uh, if you want to just stay on the news guard, uh, we're looking at potentially uh, a big story coming out of Arizona. So Arizona has been, I would say, a purple state for a while now. And people are talking about how it could flip more blue. Uh, the Arizona Supreme Court today ruled that it's going to uphold an 1864 law banning almost all abortions. Justice's rule to hold off on requiring state to enforce the ban for 14 days to allow advocates to ask lower courts to pause it again. The Arizona Supreme Court uh, da, 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 justices as Arizona can enforce a 1864 near total ban first passed before Arizona became a state that went unenforced for decades after the U.S. Supreme Court legalized abortion nationwide 1973 decision Roe v. Wade. However, the justices also ruled, blah, blah, blah. The ban can only be enforced prospectively according to the 4-2 to two ruling minutes after ruling Chris Mays, Arizona's Democratic Attorney General, vowed not to prosecute any doctor or women under the 1864 ban. Today's decision to reimpose a law from a time when Arizona wasn't a state, the Civil War was raging, and women couldn't even vote will go down in history as a stain on our state. Yeah, I, I'd agree with that. But my real question to you, Gavin, is do you think this will mobilize the Democratic Party and give them something to turn out for because it's a very legitimate threat now? And do you think that this does uh, help Biden secure Arizona? Oh, dude, 100%. 100%. I, I'm actually starting to think that you know, Biden's going to win this election based solely around the issue of abortion. And I know that's you know kind of a liberal media sort of a take, but the Republicans are just completely shooting themselves in the foot over and over again with instances like this. I don't know if we talked about it, but also in Florida, abortion is going to be up for the vote on a ballot measure at the same time that legal marijuana is, which is going to be on the 2024 ballot. Definitely, that's going to make Florida closer than I ever thought it would be. I still, you know, I don't think that Joe Biden's going to win Florida, um, but that's certainly going to mobilize a lot more left leaning and Democratic voters to come out to the polls in the state of Florida to, you know, vote for uh, uh, legal abortion and cannabis. Um, and in the same way, yeah, I totally think this is going to result in a huge backlash and it, that it will totally uh, mobilize Democratic and left leaning voters in the state of Arizona as well. It really seems like uh, a lot of people since, you know, Roe versus Wade was overturned, they've almost kind of become single issue voters and they really, really want to preserve this right. And they really, really want to uh, fight back against the Republican agenda on this issue as they see the consequences um, from states, you know, passing these six week abortion bans and stuff like that. It seems like Georgia is the only state left in the South that hasn't. That what hasn't that's that hasn't imposed like a seriously draconian abortion ban. Oh yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, but yeah, do, do you agree with that, Zach? That like more so than Trump's criminality or Biden's age or honestly even the war in uh, Israel and Gaza. I, I think that abortion might be the the number one issue in 2024, and I think that it might uh, tip the scales in in Joe Biden's direction. Yeah. I think that's I think that's exactly right because they've made it so there's absolutely nothing else tangible on the board from either side. What is tangible from the Republican Party if you vote for Donald Trump? Just an amorphous sticking it to Joe Biden. Oh, I think he'll be good for the economy. Oh, I think he's going to solve the border crisis. Oh, I think that he is going to really punch China or Iran in the mouth or whatever you're looking for from Donald Trump. It's not a serious campaign promise, right? It's not anything concrete. What did Donald Trump have in 2016? Concrete campaign promises, things that people could visualize, 
things that people could imagine him executing delusional of course building a wall you know making mexico pay for it all of the just extremely outlandish promises that he made but he was making specific promises i'm going to redo nafta i'm going to bring the jobs back home i'm going to get you a raise i'm going to make sure that you know you can afford a house whatever he was lying to people about right now he's not doing any of that. Joe Biden not doing any of that. So what it what becomes the tangible issues? Of course, there you know, and nobody like us would ever just pause thinking about the war in Gaza, the atrocities that are happening because it's it's such a real issue. It's such a fucking in our face human rights abuse. But unfortunately, and this has almost always been true of America. Unfortunately, that just doesn't matter. And you can point to the Vietnam War and be like, "Wow, people cared then." And I was like, "They cared then after the draft started." Yep. And Noam Chomsky talks about this. That's why he believes in the draft. Noam Chomsky to this day will die in believing for the draft because he was like, then those people will burn their dra draft cards and join the anti-war movement. He was like, before 1968, he was like, there was no movement. Uh, well, he, he was like, he was like, I was talking in people's living rooms that were like from the like peace and green, you know, the modern day Green Party, like the people who were had no power. And then he was like, once the students, you know, started to revolt because they were going, you know, the people that they knew, their friends were being drafted, their draft card could get called. That was when it became a militant resistance right so never in our history have we ever decided that we were going to fall on our fucking sword or take a big swing uh for some suffering people abroad it's never happened i pray for the day that that happens that we wake up and we collectively empathize but we haven't even been able to do that for the minority groups that are suffering right here in america right and and of course the scale is different but their proximity is different as well so i think that what it will come down to is that a majority of the democratic voters a majority of voters period are either going to stay home or or they're going to be mobilized over something like abortion, or they're going to be mobilized over something like legalizing cannabis. And I know that Joe Biden is such a drug warrior, and so he might not go for this, but I think if he gets desperate and he thinks it'll get him across the line, I think he'll start leaning into the cannabis talk. I think it's free. So it does it, it makes investors happy, and they'll they'll coach him into thinking that it's not him going against his uh drug uh crusading. Uh he'll talk about how it gives us just you know, spinning it gives us more resources for to fight against fentanyl, you know, it gives us more. More res uh, resources to go against big pharma whatever the fuck he wants to spin it as i don't give a shit but i think that could get him across the hump i think you're right and i think if you look at the polls that we just threw up there uh he's at donald trump's tail right now and we're so far from the election and there's still a lot more of the trial to come out there's still a lot more of the donald trump getting skinnier which we could talk about ozempic trump you know <laughs> is that gonna is that gonna cost him i just i think that at the end of the day, it's a real close race, but the, I think it goes to Biden. I, I do too, bro. And if it weren't for the abortion thing, I would be far less confident in that prediction. But we've seen how it's affected the turnout, specifically in the midterm election 2022. That was, uh, remember the red wave, the big red wave that was supposed to materialize? Whatever happened to that? Um, and, and now we have a bunch more of these, you know, Trump crazy kind of candidates, people like Carrie Lake, um, you know, in, in states like Arizona, people don't want that shit. They don't want it. Um, and instead of focusing on a more populist message about immigration or trade or whatever, you know, Trump was able to spin up in 2016, he's going to be uh, distracted, frankly, on the campaign trail talking about the abortion issue. Let's take a look at this clip. Shout out to breaking points. I'm just going to, you know, use their, uh, their video where they played it. Um, but listen to how like almost kind of confused Trump sounds on the issue of abortion. It's, it seems like he can't quite articulate a stance, let alone control the narrative like he normally does. Um, so it's kind of weird to see Trump like flopping around like a fish out of water, unable to kind of get a get a handle on the base or the messaging of his own party but i honestly i don't think he really knows what to do and this clip is further evidence of that very mixed messaging coming from the republicans on abortion as they scramble to try to figure out how to get some of those voters back that they lost after the fall of roe but yeah let's take a look at this i thought this was pretty funny republican party will always support the creation of strong thriving and healthy American families. We want to make it easier for mothers and families to have babies, not harder. That includes supporting the availability of fertility treatments like IVF in every state in America. 
like the overwhelming majority of Americans, including the vast majority of Republicans, conservatives, Christians, and pro-life Americans, I strongly support the availability of IVF for couples who are trying to have a precious baby. What could be more beautiful or better than that? Many people have asked me what my position is on abortion and abortion rights, especially since I was proudly the person responsible for the ending of something that all legal scholars, both sides, wanted and, in fact, demanded be ended. Roe v. Wade. My view is now that we have abortion where everybody wanted it from a legal standpoint, the states will determine by vote or legislation or perhaps both And whatever they decide must be the law of the land. In this case, the law of the state. Yeah. So I I don't know, man. It seems like he's speaking out of both sides of his mouth there, right? Like on one hand, he's like, I'm so proud to have appointed the justices that overturn Roe v. Wade. Thank God we did that, right? But also, don't worry. The Republican Party still believes in the right to IVF. And and don't worry. Don't freak out. It's all good. We're not that extreme. We're going to leave it up to the states. That's what you guys wanted all along, right? States' rights. That's what we are in favor of. States' rights. Uh, You know, sorry if you live in fucking Mississippi and now you can't get an abortion anymore, but you like states' rights, right? Of course, um, it seems very confused. It doesn't really seem like he's dominating the uh, narrative when it comes to the subject matter. It just sounds like the you know entire Republican Party, including Trump, is scrambling to figure out how the hell they're going to message their way out of this problem that they created. Right. And one of the things that we did uh, really early on on the show was we've had Frank Schaefer on twice. We had him on early on in the Vanguard history and we had um, him on after the fall of Roe v. Wade. So check out both those interviews if you guys want to, you know, get the inside scoop on, you know, the son of Francis Schaefer, who was one of the leading evangelical voices during the Reagan administration when the uh, Republican Party decided to make abortion a critical issue. Guys, it was a it was considered a narrow Catholic issue at the time in the early 80s. And actually, a lot of Protestant Baptist uh, you know, religious leaders, they didn't give a fuck about abortion, bro. It was like, it was like the death penalty. It was something that was very much associated with Catholic nuns and the, uh, you know, the, like the religious by the Bible, you know, thou shall not kill people, people like my grandma who are like really like by the book Catholics. Okay. It was seen as a niche issue. And they were like, no, we're going to make this one of the, you know, the crusading marks of the Republican party. And we're going to do that by, uh, and, and the, basically the quid pro quo is going to be that we're going to use that to make the Republican party more religious. And so that's how they started to tether themselves by getting those congregations to vote for them. They were like, we're going to do, you know, the word of the gospel. And that was how, you know, after really presenting the presidency pretty secularly. I mean, the country by and large was more religious at the time. So you'll still see like references to God and that kind of stuff. But it was the, it was the end of the Carter administration, the beginning of the Reagan administration, when they really tried to make the conservative party, the religious party in America wouldn't have made sense to before then uh, because everybody in America was the religious party. So you, you start to see them kind of uh, tether those things together. But what my question for you is Gavin, what happens to the uh, Mike Pence, voters what happens to you know the the true believers whatever happened to the people who you know we're going to be the generation that's pro-life and all that kind of shit uh who do they vote for does this you know make them less excited about donald trump does this make them want to withhold their vote does this send them in another direction they have they're kind of in the position that a lot of the left is in where they don't have another fucking option right they sure as shit aren't going to vote for joe biden i think donald trump knows this and i think it's actually a decently smart position for him to take that he doesn't because the only other option for him is to say that he's you know fully pro-life raw 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 crusader and i think that he knows that's a loser a political loser yep exactly there's actually an interesting political uh piece that kind of gets into that um so there's these anti-abortion groups that are of course still rallying behind trump but despite their disappointment they say we are deeply disappointed in yep. president trump's position um but of course they don't really have another option they're kind of stuck with trump uh, it, it kind of reminds me almost like you know if you invert this and and make it like a left-wing thing like say bernie was our nominee or something but then on the campaign trail he he uh he was like, actually, we're not going to do Medicare for all anymore, you know, or something like that. He kind of like abandoned his uh, support for what we're going to do is expand the public option <laughs> and uh, and uh, fortify Obamacare and make it a send us send send Obama uh, <laughs> o- o- Obama and us, uh, affordable health care plan part 2.0. <laughs> exactly. And and that would leave a lot of, you know, leftist activists in a weird place where obviously Bernie would still be the 
better pick on healthcare. Um, but you know, that would disappoint a lot of the progressive base in the same way Trump's in this weird place where he can't, he can't go too far. He can't piss off the super uh, anti-abortion people too much because they are a significant part of the base. The evangelicals are arguably the most important uh, faction of the voting electorate for the GOP. So he can't piss them off too much, uh, but they also don't really have anywhere to go. They don't really have another option. They don't have someone who's like, you know, more pro-life than Donald Trump. And of course, he can always uh, correctly go back to the line that he did install the justices that overturned Roe versus Wade. But yeah, it's interesting to see this divide and uh, Trump and the Republicans in general kind of trying to, you know, uh, dance this very specific dance where you, uh, don't piss off the base while also trying to appeal to the broader electorate. But yeah, they are not abandoning him, at least according to Politico, after a more than a year long pressure campaign pushing the former president to call for federal restrictions on abortion. Top anti abortion groups on Monday were dealt a major blow. Trump announced he believes abortion should be regulated at the state level. So, of course, that's the video we just played where Trump was kind of. Uh, you know, making official his stance that no, he doesn't want to pursue a, uh, you know, federal ban on abortion. And that's, of course, the position of guys like Mike Pence and Lindsey Graham, who represent that uber evangelical pro-life voting demographic that, yeah, will definitely be pissed off about this, but it's not like they're going to vote for Joe Biden. Yep, and that's the lovely state of American politics, right? Oh, sorry, you want to be represented? Well, there's no home for you. Pick one of these binary options or shut the fuck up. Um, I love to look, and, and it goes back to one of the things that I know it's tired. I say it all the time, but the reason that they have to spend your first, like, I don't know, 18 years of life beating it into your head that, oh, we're the only country with freedom. We're the free country. We're the only country in the world that's free. Other people hate us because of our freedom. Oh, yes, the United States is the democracy. Yes, the world's first. And basically, they presented as the only democracy in the world. Oh, every other country wishes they were America. Meanwhile, you go and talk to some fuckers from other countries like Finland, Switzerland, Sweden, France. They'd be like, I fucking never moved to America. Are you kidding me? What happens if you get shot there? What are you going to fuck cost you thirty thousand dollars? Like this is the kind of thing that people will say to you if you meet them in another country. It's fucking wild. Uh, they actually think that getting shot is common in America, and it's not as uncommon as you'd like to present it. They think it's the wild fucking west here. If you talk to people from a, a European country that's like extremely safe, where they'll be like, "Oh yes, well there was a stabbing back in 2014," and you're like, "Yeah, dude, that was a decade ago, pal." Like, <laughs> well, the one man he littered on the street in Switzerland, you're like, "Oh yeah, that was must have been a tragedy." Um, Anyway, one thing, speaking of another tragedy, Gavin, if we can change the title a little bit, keeping it on it, mostly the same topic, but a little bit different. Uh, I tweeted this out the other day, and I, I, I'm i disappointed in our audience, okay? So I see I saw this insane nature video. Nature is amazing, right? Uh, <laughs> I saw when you tweeted this. <laughs> and I woke up in the morning, I was like, oh, that's fucking hilarious. So let me go ahead and just tweet out <laughs> when your girl was out of town all week. And I was like, this is fucking hilarious. Anyway, you guys hung me out to dry. Whenever I tweet something truly hilarious you guys will be like nah we're passing on that but i'll be like i'll be like ceasefire now and you guys will be like 20k fucking favorites i'm like oh you just you know no no room for actual humor on the internet when iana saw this she was like what the fuck does that get diarrhea when when his girlfriend gets back from being out of town oh well the obvious joke was right over the head right over the head she's like should have captured it when you get back from taco bell or something you know lol <laughs> But no, I, I thought that was funny, Zach. So you, know, you have yeah. uh, that is the only audience that I'm here to amuse. I'm sorry. <laughs> Shout out to Gabe on the overcast point. That is what severely deterred the experiences of solar eclipse here in the Northeast. Yeah, dude. Uh, man, let me tell you exactly. Yeah, here, here's what you should do. If you if you guys ever want to experience what it's like to see a solar eclipse, all you have to do is uh, put your hands up against your eyes like this and then start to apply a little bit of pressure. Not too much pressure. Don't hurt yourself. Just apply a little bit of pressure. And then you're going to see these little rings that start to emerge right behind your eye. Congratulations. You just saw a total solar eclipse. It was awesome. It was free. And Gabe, you got to do it from the comfort of wherever the fuck you are now. So you guys thank me later. Uh, tips and tricks. Um, yeah. Yeah. Shout out to you, Gabe. Uh, I feel like it's probably pretty often overcast in the northeast oh wait no wait northeast i was thinking of like the pacific northwest so maybe not i'm not sure about the northeast but uh yeah that sucks bro that sucks bro i hope you weren't too excited um but thank you so much for the 10 bucks and shout out to you tony as well for the two bucks there are no police in finland 
That's not it's, true, I, but I feel like there probably is. There are. <laughs> there are there, I met a Finnish guy one time, actually. Let me tell this story. This was fun. This man was a fiberglass tycoon and he was like, he had a Superman hat on and he was kind of a chunky guy. And he was at one of the two legal bars in Kotao to, that you could smoke weed at. Right. Gavin, you may have ever seen the picture of me. I'm smoking this like ginormous ass fuck. And I'm like all disheveled. Cause I've been to Thailand, never shaved in fucking two weeks. Right. Um, and this guy's like, I am fiberglass man. I am super nerd. And this dude's fucked up on mushrooms and fucking <laughs> weed. And, and they found they, this guy who speaks English and his, his friend next to me, who's like marrying some Thai chick he's like he's like oh yeah man you could just buy a weed by the brick if you rent a room here and he was like we don't stay here because it's a shithole but we rent the room just so we could buy the fucking uh weed bricks and this dude's just grinding up like piles and piles of weed and now the weed in thailand is not the best right and he's like i tell these fuckers if you leave it on the fucking thing you know anyway but uh he's sitting there and he rolls this fucking huge ass thing and this dude had a, he sailed his own fucking boat to kotao island i was like anyway Damn. that's the only finnish guy i've ever met but i do believe they have police there <laughs> yeah yeah didn't you get harassed by some of them at one point no no, no, no that was, that was the thai yeah. police yeah. No, no, the thai police, they will shake you the fuck down bro and that was after i mean i was fucked up guys i was leaving that fucking high bar and of course, dude if you know me if you've ever met me one thing i was going to do while i was in thailand was sit somewhere beautiful and drink cappuccinos and smoke joints like i'm fucking that was the that was the apex of my life at that point point. and when i'm coming like down this whole oh, fucking like walking back to where i'm supposed to you know like the squad hole that i was uh you know staying at it was like fucking like, <laughs> like fucking 30 baht a day something ridiculously cheap like a dollar usd anyway they they shook me down because i know my passport because i give my passport to this guy who in order to rent a uh like a scooter on the island and everybody uh, no in order to rent a scooter on the island, you have to give this guy your passport he puts it in a safe and then he gives you the keys to the scooter and it's because he wants to make sure you come back with that scooter in my hindsight i probably wouldn't do that again but at the time i was like sure bro you need my passport i got it right here and uh yeah so i didn't have this passport when the police wanted to fucking talk to me Ooh. about it and they kept talking to me in thai and i'm like bro i have zero thai bro like i just i don't even know how to say so sorry terrifying. In thai. yeah it wasn't that bad though they all dress up like the military though they had they had a big truck with a spotlight Ooh. and uh the way that kotal's organized is it's like a big island so there's a big road that goes around the outside and yeah anyway yeah dude uh, that sounds heavenly, as Cosette says. Bro, that Kotel's awesome. It's all run by the mafia, and so I learned <laughs> later after I left that it's probably not the best uh, vacation island because you're not really supporting like a, the in you know the local population there. You know, you better to go to different parts of Thailand. Um, oh. But that it's not sucks. like you're doing a fucking community service hanging out in Bangkok either, which is where <laughs> yeah. I was before I got down there. <laughs> yep. Well, dude, do you want to call it a stream? Is there anything else you wanted to chat about? Uh, we could talk about how we you, you heard it on the Vanguard. Speaking of our tweets that have aged like fucking fine wine that I don't think got enough uh, love from our audience. Uh, we'll, we'll just vent back. You guys leave the comment section. This is the time I'm leaving comments for you, audience. Uh, we, we could we could give the update <laughs> on the so so uh, Kendrick Lamar. And for all of you who don't know this, this is a Kendrick Lamar stan account. J. Cole, I've always been a little bit of a hater on. I liked that uh, 2014 Forest Drive record, and that's absolutely it. And he has never been on the level of Kendrick Lamar. His pen has always been so soft. Anyway, he tried to take a shot at Kendrick on this like seven minute drill uh, track that he released. And only three days later, guys. He had to come out and release an apology and apologize to Kendrick Lamar and say that, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't really want to start beef. Uh, and it was humiliating. And so we've officially laid to rest who the official conscious rapper of our time is. It's Kendrick Lamar. Nobody even comes close. I know it's a cliche. White guy that loves Kendrick. I'm sorry. The It, it wasn't me that made that a cliche. It was a little man named Melon on the internet. And that, that's on him. That's on him. That's not. Him. Don't hold me against it. I was in, I was a freaking junior in high school when this came out, and it broke the fucking internet. Everybody was losing their mind about that uh, when a uh, Pimp a Butterfly came out, and it's kind of been the magnum opus for Kendrick ever since. But Gavin's pissing, so I'm going to take the Zach guard over. Uh, shout out to you, Audie the Bug Catcher. Really appreciate the generous uh, donation of five more Vanguard memberships. So shout out to you guys. Now that you have memberships, you can check out our new show that we release every week with our good pal Griffin for members only on the uh, Vanguard membership or the, yeah, the members only portion of the channel. Also, if you're a Patreon member and you're not a member of the YouTube memberships, I can send you guys the link and you guys can view it that way as well. Um, so yeah, check out that for some bonus content for you guys. You know, this week we, uh, you know, we're spinning through the daily wire as it were mm -hmm. yeah. about Patrick Bateman's podcast. We, it was, it was a lively time.
Yeah, absolutely. Shout out to you, Adi. Always appreciate seeing you in the chat. Always appreciate the generosity from you, man. Really appreciate the five Vanguard memberships. And yeah, on the circle jerk note, everyone make sure to check out the latest episode. I, I think we're really getting good. The podcast is really, you know, uh, becoming its own. Um, so I think that, you know, in the coming weeks and months, we're really going to start producing some amazing content over on circle jerk america so everyone definitely check that out we're having a great time developing the show not even 10 episodes yet but i think we're really you know finding our footing we're finding so our speak. footing a lot faster than we did with the vanguard let me tell you what yeah. oh Fuck. my god we, gavin and i had a lot of you know we had a lot of polishing up to do you know what i mean <laughs> we both had our strengths and we both had our weaknesses you know it was like the perfect collision of like confidence and delusion <laughs> that led us a long ways but here we are now happy as clams uh shout out to you audi the bug catcher and yeah i was really happy with this week's circle jerk america for people who get a little fucking ruffled feathers no it's not the same show uh it's much more comedy oriented it's much more talking over each other oriented it's a podcast not a live stream so um you know just a way for us to keep our tools sharp keep us diversify and keep us making unique fun content for you and we like having our homie griffin on uh this show a lot but it's cool to do a, a, like you know our own thing as well Yep. You know, think yep. of it as a side project, right? Th think of it as like, you know, you have Green Day and then you have the Foxborough hot tubs, you know, it, it's like a it's like a way less successful, you know, way, you know, less discovered, but potentially more interesting side project. It's like the voids. Like this is the strokes. There we Circle go. Circle jerk is the voids. That's a there much better analogy. I was trying <laughs> to think of a I was trying to think of a uh like a side project that people would know and then that's true but is the voice really a side project or is it just julian casablanca's new band that's a good point uh, but i think the strokes still do release albums every oh, like, they do yeah so i guess it technically is a side project but i don't know same, the three same guys kind of that are in green day they just called themselves the other when they want to go back to making oakland punk music and i'm like why wouldn't you they... guys just yeah yeah when they want to go good? I mean, no, but it sounds way better than the shit they're putting out now. It's just like fast Oakland 90s punk stuff. And you're just like, no, that's actually kind of interesting. Like you're yeah. 50 years old, so it's a little weird watching it. You know, it's like if I were to go out and see like social distortion out and, and you know, and be like, ah, it's cool when you watch their Ring of Fire cover, but they're really old guys out there now. You're like, oh, it's weird to see you go out there and be punk rock. It's like Henry Rollins, you know, like he doesn't perform anymore because he's like, I don't I don't want to be the, you know, old punk guy that's still performing. I'm like, I get that. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of that one country musician who has like the alternate persona do you know what i'm talking about there's like some pretty famous country musician who apparently like also releases albums under a totally different name that are way better and more interesting i i, I don't know his name though someone in chat <laughs> help me out <laughs> yeah i have no idea but that, that sounds good oh blink boxcar racer wow that's a pull john ross that's a pull uh yeah what let me let me like uh boxcar racer what's the name of that uh uh, song that they did. Uh, it's I'm, it's gonna come to me. It's gonna come to me. What's it? Oh, oh yeah. It's the I feel so mad. I feel so angry. That's the one that they did. Lost, confused, abandoned. Yeah. Okay. I was like, I know, I know that song. Where do I know that song from? Boxcar Racer. Wow. What a pull from my fucking like fourteen year old mind hole right there. They also had Angels and Airwaves. Um. Damn, John Which Ross was, also got my reference. Yeah, I was talking about, I guess, Garth Brooks also releases albums under Chris Gaines, uh, or at least he used to. And some people say those are actually pretty good records, but I never checked well, them Well, I mean, that dude can say what you will about Garth Brooks. That dude knows how to write a hit. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, he sold out. He Doesn't he have the record for, t like, the Sprint Center? Uh, he sold it out, like, three I think days. So. <laughs> And, and he sold it out like three days in a row. He's always in, like in the top tier of the most profitable acts every year. If you read that, it's like him and Bruce Springsteen and like the Eagles when they were performing. It was like, you know, he was p pulling in huge angels and airways was wax. All right. I literally don't know anything about them except for I'm going to find the one song I do know uh, from them <laughs> really quickly. Let's see here. Uh, uh, I don't know. Oh, secret crowd stand. Yeah, that's the one that I knew. Anyway, it's it, you, once you hear Tom DeLonge's voice, you have to sing it. <laughs> How did I get famous like this? I'm singing a song and I'm real sad. But like, they pulled it off, dude. It's a miracle. He's like, he had one of the wackest voices I've ever heard. And yet, dude, millions of seventh graders just poured out to go see this guy. They were like, it was like the second coming of Christ to them. They have their wristbands and they're like, you know, you know, <laughs> hot topic t shirts. And you're just like, yeah, but I can't talk shit. When I was in seventh grade, I was one of them.
<laughs> yeah, dude, I never, I never got as into all that, uh, like that genre. But you, you have know, to, you have to wonder about people who are like forty years old and they're still singing about their parents' divorce. Like, you know, <laughs> dad never played catch with me. You know, and it's just like, dude, you're fucking grown up. Like, fucking go, go, fucking play catch with your buddy. Like, go, go, you're, you've got a million dollars. Go hire a fucking dude from the Royals to teach you to play catch. Like, shut up. <laughs> yeah, it's always weird when people like specifically write for a younger demographic, even though they can't really relate necessarily anymore it's that's always a bizarre phenomenon but yeah if you, uh, have you heard their new uh i wish we could play it i i can't uh, the new blink 182 song came on when i was like driving in the car the other day and i was like oh my god it's so bad it's just like <laughs> strangers from strangers to brothers i just it's so bad people in chat will know what i'm talking about we're losing people because i'm just doing bad karaoke at this point but we don't have the rest of the show plan so it's either you know jump off or keep riding the 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 uh crazy train <laughs> yeah is this the is this the new album i don't know if this is one of their old ones or if this is a new one they look old as fuck on this this is the new one because tom DeLong's back they kicked tom DeLong out of the band for a while and they had this dude matt skiba be their front man who was from another group from that time period called alkaline trio uh and then that's when they put out that california record when it sounded like way different um and nobody wants to see blink 182 unless you can hear the where are you and i'm so, so you know it's like dude, nobody's here for mark hoppus hello there the angel from my nightmare that's how that guy sings the fact that these guys are famous it was a real it was a real lightning in a bottle moment for them it's crazy it'd be like if the island boys blew up and became famous <laughs> yeah yeah pretty cringe stuff but anyway anything else you want to chat with uh today zach not really i'm trying to think of anything else that we could touch base on obviously there's the new david lynch rumors mm. if you wanted to say anything about that for the good people of the podcast that's a good point yeah i've been like really hoping that david lynch isn't actually retired there's a lot of haters weirdly in the david lynch community like if you go on the david lynch like subreddits and stuff that are when anyone ever tries to talk about like a new david lynch project they're just like he's retired like you know stop fantasizing about it twin peaks i know and it's annoying because I'm like, bro, he's not even that old. He's like in his mid 70s, younger than Ridley Scott by like 10 years, younger than Martin Scorsese by like he's almost 10 years. He's not. Is, is, is Ridley Scott 88? Wait, David Lynch is 78? I thought he was like 75. That's crazy. No, he was born in 1946. So he's an old fucking man, dude. And he has and he has a smoking problem. Well, maybe he's quit smoking now, but he has I mean, emphysema. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I know uh, what you're saying. I'm, I'm not saying he's a young guy, a fucking spring chicken. But yeah, yeah. what is? Oh, it's 1980. He's a 40 year old man. I don't People say he's fast as fuck. R Ridley Scott is like fucking 85, though. I'm not even kidding. Like, look up Ridley Scott's age. That dude, I, he might even be 86, which is genuinely crazy. I'm like, what the fuck? Make that dude president. Uh, um, Ridley Scott is 86, and that yeah. is crazy. Yeah, he's about to direct so a, he another is, movie. You were right. He's about 10 years older than fucking... That's insanity. Yeah, so there's really no reason he needs to retire or that he should retire, unless he truly wants to, of course. I know he just went through a like fourth divorce, and obviously he has his uh, emphysema from a lifetime of smoking. But this news broke the other day, which was fascinating, but also tragic. David Lynch is still hoping to make animated movie Snoot World, which he scripted with Adam's Family and Edward Scissorhands writer Carolyn Thompson. It's a story that children and adults can appreciate. Um, so this is interesting. David Lynch has never done an animated film. He has done animation before. He did a, a short animated series called Dumb World in the 2000s and has dabbled in the medium before. Six men getting sick six times. Yep, yep. Going back to the OG, he's always had... Uh, uh, an appreciation for animation. Um, but this one sounds really interesting to me, specifically because it's, it's seemingly, you know, kid friendly. Like it, it's something that children and adults could appreciate, which you could not say about the vast majority of David Lynch uh, projects, of course. Um, but yeah, screen legend Lynch has said little publicly about Snoot World until now. And in recent months has quick, uh, quietly tried to breathe life into the project by seeking a financier. He began working on the script two decades ago with former Tim Burton collaborator, Carolyn Thompson writer of uh, nightmare before Christmas and Edward Scissorhands. Um, I don't, 
know when I started thinking about snoots, but I do these drawings of snoots and then a story started to emerge. Lynch told us in a rare interview, I got together with Carolyn and we worked on a script just recently. I thought someone might be interested in getting behind this. So I presented it to Netflix in the last few months, but they rejected it. And he says, the reason for that decision was the snoot world is kind of an old fashioned story and animation today is more about surface jokes. Old fashioned fairy tales are considered groaners. Apparently people don't want to see them. It's a different world now and it's easier to say no than yes. And take a look at the, uh, at the premise for this he uh, or thompson described the storyline as wackadoo it takes my breath away how wacky it is the snoots are these tiny creatures who have a ritual transition at age eight at which time they get tinier and they're sent away for a year so they are protected the world goes into chaos when the snoot hero of the story disappears into the carpet and his family can't find him and he enters a crazy magnificent world so that sounds awesome to me it sounds totally trippy completely lynchy and but i i actually do kind of like the idea of it being kid friendly you know there's not enough entertainment that's kid friendly that's also just like super fucking weird and kind of dark and i think that you know goes right back to what he commented about fairy tales like old-fashioned fairy tales a lot of old-fashioned fairy tales despite the fact that they are for kids are really really weird they're dark and trippy and psychedelic um and you know I, I feel like a lot of the children's entertainment these days is just so sanitized and they just you know treat kids like they can't handle any uh dark concepts or anything like that um so i hope this gets made at some point um in addition to his other projects which he's failed to get financing for like his uh rumored show wisteria which was supposedly also going to happen at netflix but then got the uh cord pulled on it so i just think it's tragic that someone with david lynch's stature like one of the most legendary directors of all time and someone who's quite successfully connected with younger generations you know there's some directors who were big back in like the 80s and 90s but they don't really have much of a following now david lynch is not one of those people he has a ton of fans including young people that really connect with his work obviously twin peaks probably being the main example of that but i think that you know netflix is idiotic for turning him down i feel like if netflix premiered a david lynch animated movie or a david lynch anything that it would be a big hit for the site and that people would really get into it do, do you think that's crazy Gavin, unfortunately, yes. I think that this was a, <laughs> this is a recipe to lose a fuckload of money really? for them, and so a hundred percent, dude. No, like you are the absolute one percent of the one percent David Lynch fandom. Most people, I like, I can tell you, even myself, like I like David Lynch a lot. I'm not sure I would watch it. I'm not sure I would tune in. I maybe I would, maybe I wouldn't. And I am like of the generation of people that he has connected with, and I do appreciate his work. But I'm like listening to that, watching that. I'm like, it's made for kids. I'll be like, great. I'm happy that that put that he put that out. But it's kind of like when Guillermo del Toro does shit like this. I'm like, I still haven't watched any of the fucking Guillermo del Toro things that he put out. I haven't watched any of the Wes Anderson short stories. So I'm just not sure that when directors have an idea away from what they have become really known for, like if David Lynch wanted to put out a movie that was like a crime thriller uh, that had a bunch of like interloping narratives and was something that they could see themselves getting their money back on, I think they would finance it. But I think after how much... Uh, Twin Peaks, the return cost after all the chaos that he caused with Showtime after wanting it to be exactly his fucking way. And then they're seeing this doesn't even have nearly the draw of Twin Peaks because it's not a, you know, an IP already. I just think I could see a bunch of reasons from the other side of the desk that they're like, hey, David, we love you. And if you want to do something like like uh, what would Jack do where it costs us like, you know, 20 grand and we can put a David Lynch thing on our uh channel again yeah we'll do that but you know a full series of animation which is really expensive and a bunch of ideas and the way david wants to do it uh i just i don't think it ever gets made i i definitely understand where you're coming from but my pushback to that would be that animation isn't that expensive like animation is i feel like the easiest possible way for Netflix to approve a David Lynch project just because it's not as difficult to pull off. You only have to hire a you know team of animators to make it happen. I'm sure it would still be costly, but I, I just feel like they wouldn't lose that much money on it, no more than they lose routinely when they bankroll all sorts of random shitty-ass movies and shows for their service. It, it just seems like a weird 
choice because like animation is actually pretty big right now not just with kids but with adults too there's a lot of huge animated shows that are geared towards adults like that uh show invincible that's really popular on netflix obviously netflix had bojack horseman which was one of their biggest shows rick and morty had its huge moment animation is a uh, but those is, are all is, comedies i think this would be a comedy i think this would be a comedy not one of those kinds of comedies fair enough but i, I still think that they're like they had that uh you know what was that show the uh with the guy who always goes on joe rogan the midnight special do you remember watching oh, that oh i did watch that and that was one season and it didn't get picked up because it lost a bunch of money and i liked it you don't think it it made them any money oh i i, I was pretty sure that it didn't and that's why duncan trussell didn't get his uh the rest of his uh netflix uh stuff out interesting i, I just thought that it was supposed to be a one season thing it seemed like it concluded on a pretty you know final oh, note I thought that but it was like a tee up for him to do a special for them but that could have been wrong and maybe i'm not, I'm not sure about all that it, it just seems like you know there is a there is a market for animation and with this specifically it could appeal to adults and children i don't know it's and and the writer of it literally wrote freaking nightmare before christmas one of the most you know famous and popular animated movies of all time plus edward scissorhands like it seems like at least could attract some attention and with the amount of uh, attention that david lynch gets online i think it could trend i think people would talk about it it seems like something that netflix could you know pay david lynch to create if they're gonna you know pay Zack snyder enough money to make rebel moon part one and two which no one really gave a shit about um but i definitely understand your pushback like i'm not saying it would be a slam dunk uh easy easy win financially but LOL, David Lynch directs an episode of Bob's Burgers, which dives into the backstory of the Hell's Inspector, voiced by Sam Cedar. Yeah, that would be your ultimate fantasy, Autumn Leaves. A whole a whole episode just about the Health Inspector. What's his name? I love that character in Bob's Burgers. Oh, oh, God. No, it's not Teddy. It, it, Teddy's the other guy. I don't know, actually. The Health Inspector, Bob's Sam Burger. Cedar. Health Inspector. What is it? Uh, oh, yeah, Hugo. Hugo, Hugo. of course. Of course. I know a dog named Hugo. <laughs> anyway, yeah, let's hope David Lynch gets that financing and let's hope he makes at least one more project before he actually does retire. Um, that's my hope at least. But yeah, it's, it's I hope he gets a project too. I just if he's only gonna do one more before he retires and your gun to my head, I'd be like, nah, David, let's shake the shuffleboard a little bit one more time and put out something that's not an animated children's show. I'd like to see you do a crime thriller again, but I'm being selfish. I, well, I feel like he does. He would. He does have other projects that he would prioritize ahead of this one, but he can't get financing for them either. Because he he did uh, pitch this whole show that was supposedly going to be called either Wisteria or Unrecorded Night. That some people, you know, were theorizing was connected to Twin Peaks. That was gonna be a go with Netflix for like eight or ten episodes or something. But then it's unclear if they pulled the plug on it or if COVID, you know, took it off their schedule. I don't. I don't really know what all happened. Um, but yeah, he has, he's had other projects that aren't animated that he's also failed to get financing for, um, which again, is just such a, such a crazy thing that directors like David Lynch, uh, John Waters, another one who has another project that can't get enough money to be made yet. Hopefully it does. He just said that it, it doesn't have enough money. Um, but yeah, uh, Aubrey Plaza is attached to that one. I'd love to see John Waters make another movie, and I think he will eventually get financing for it. But it's just crazy that these like you know titans can't can't get their money. Uh, Francis Ford Coppola obviously had to sell his wine company to make Megalopolis. So yeah, it's it's tough out there. Francis Ford Coppola also famously cost production companies a <laughs> shitload of money throughout its career, yeah. hundreds of millions of dollars, and he would be <laughs> importing fucking luxury. Like I, I like Francis is a gr great. But there's a reason why he's not making movies like Scorsese was his whole career. There's a reason why he didn't get work like Ridley Scott got his whole career was because he made a bunch of busts and he got them to invest shit tons of money in movies that didn't go anywhere in his Zoetro <laughs> production company it turned out to be a huge disaster, even though it made a fuckload of money off of the first couple of movies. It was anyway. Francis yeah. Ford Coppola is a mixed bag, but I agree. And it's like John Waters. It's not like John Waters always had like, you know. Uh, mass massive budget, but he—I mean—he's made Hairspray, he made Cry Baby, he made you know Pink Flamingos for the you know late night crowd. Yeah, he, a, a legend for sure. It just seems crazy that like some company like A twenty four, like someone wouldn't just be like, yeah, of course, like just of course we're gonna give you. yeah, yeah, like they gave Ari Aster like almost like fifty million dollars to make Bo is Afraid, which was a huge flop. I'm like, you can't give that kind of money to fucking John Waters or David Lynch. Like, come on, make it happen. 
it, think about what a huge clout boost that would be for any company to like premiere the next David Lynch film. I, I just can't believe that there's not more, uh, you know, willingness on the part of financiers to take a chance, given the fact that, like I said, he does connect with the younger generations. People love him. He trends on social media all the time. Uh, people still talk about Twin Peaks all the time. Seems seems pretty obvious to me, especially with you know Apple giving like just unlimited money to people like Scorsese. But I think the other thing that we have to counter is that even when you do give money to people like Scorsese, when you do give them to those big household names, they haven't been making their money back. They haven't been making a huge amount. It hasn't been seen a financial return. So I think their calculation is, okay, if I can't even get my money back with a guy like Martin Scorsese or a household name for people who are under 29 with a guy like Ari Aster, then why would I give it to a guy like David Lynch who's even more niche? Why would I give it to a guy like John Waters who's even more niche? Like we might revere them more because we're film bros and we know what they're capable of, but the general population is not going to be able to understand and distinguish the difference. You know what I mean? Like they're yeah. just going to be like, this is an old director. I've heard his name before. What did he make that movie? Blue Velvet. Oh, and he did Twin Peaks. That's cool. Uh, you know, oh, he's did an animated show for kids. I don't know if I'll check that. Like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I think that's the that's the way that they're thinking about it. And obviously, there should just be money for people who are at a, a that point in their career. And that's why a lot of these directors they rely on uh, funding from like f the French government or like mm -hmm. the Greek government, not the Greek government. They don't have money to give out, but you know what I'm talking about, like money from uh, for the arts in Europe, basically. Uh, and that's how um, you know, for example, a guy like Woody Allen will always have uh, funding for his films, or you know, Froman Polanski wants to make a movie in you know Scotland. You know where you know he knows he can get safe passage back home. Uh, then they'll finance that for him. And I think if Lynch wanted to go off and do something like that, he could. But I don't think he wants to travel. I just think that he's you know he's at the point in his life where he's content to either make it or not. And he offers good ideas to people. And if they don't take it, he doesn't seem like he's going to break his back to force right. them to. No, that's definitely the case. That's definitely the case. And as for like Apple losing money on the Scorsese movies and stuff like that, I've actually heard that they like that was intentionally their strategy. They knew they would take a huge loss on Killers of the Flower Moon, for example. They just like basically funded it for the clout of having an Apple original Martin Scorsese movie. They got 10 Oscar nominations because they want to be taken seriously as a film company. Kind of like what uh, Netflix did. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But it seems like David Lynch might have like just missed the boat, you know, where they were trying to, where they were just giving blank checks to big directors, and now he's like, "Come on, where, co where's my blank check? I have some ideas." And I know him like, and David Fincher should have been on the phone in 2010, you know, when it was just a license to print money. And yeah. be like, you know, dude, you want to bring back Twin Peaks now? I mean, fucking go for it, bro. But you yeah. know, as it was, Showtime got the rights to it, and the rest is history. I think, I think if Netflix would have gotten the rights to Twin Peaks: The Return, we could have seen more content with them together. Uh, but it, Showtime was like such a horrible experience for him that I think he he was like not going to work with them again. Yeah, yeah. One last piece of movie news that I would like to get your opinion on, Zach, because we haven't really talked much about it, is the uh, the sequel for the Joker Two comes out today. Oh yeah, and, and it has Lady Gaga as Harley Quinn, and apparently it's going to be a musical with like fifteen songs in it. So do you think? Yeah, are you excited for that musical? Right. Yeah, I, I know you weren't as big a fan of the first movie as i was it's not my favorite film or anything but you know I, I did like it more than you did i that's what i remember you thought it was like too much of a taxi driver ripoff essentially i thought it was a big taxi driver ripoff but i liked a lot of the elements of it yeah that's fair i, I like that it was a comic book movie that wasn't afraid to get into more uncomfortable and adult territory it didn't feel so you know sand down and sanitized for the youth and all that stuff and it still made and a I've billion dollars anyway. of comedy or whatever the one it's based off of which i also think maybe would have contributed more to my understanding like i had like i know it was riffing off of those two scorsese movies um Honestly, but, if you saw King of Comedy, you might like it even less because then you'd be like, what, it's a ripoff of two movies I like? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it, it, um, it is absolutely a ripoff of both those movies. I just think it is a pretty good ripoff, all things considered. Um, but yeah, the, the trailer for the sequel comes out today, and I have no idea how this is going to go because obviously Lady Gaga is a huge name, but it's also true that I think the vast majority of people who were really into the first movie that actually powered it, it's a $1 billion box office haul. I don't think they're going to be particularly thrilled by the idea of watching Lady Gaga sing and Joaquin Phoenix, you know, break out into musical numbers every couple minutes. Like that just doesn't really seem like it was the vibe that attracted the original supporters of the first film. So I'm really interested to see if this is going to work not just from a artistic standpoint but from a you know commercial standpoint like it, this could be a total disaster or it could be complete brilliance and it becomes even bigger than the first movie i have no idea how this is going to go 
I think it'll just come down to word of mouth. Is it a good movie? Does it make its points? Are the musical numbers fun, prescient, commentary throughout? You know, then yeah, people will go for it, right? As far as the incels turning out for it, I think it comes down to <laughs> one thing. Uh, is there a topless scene or not? If so, then they'll be out in droves. If not, they'll stay home. It's okay. I'd rather not see them at the theater anyway. I hate when it smells in there. Um, so that's kind of my analysis, my two cents. Yeah, I think that's fair. If the movie's amazing, you're right. Word of mouth will carry it. If it sucks, then it'll probably sink. Um, but yeah, it, it is interesting that, you know, I, I didn't really see how they would be able to do a sequel to the Joker. I was like, it doesn't really like, I, I just feel like it's a pretty complete movie. Um, it was, I, do yeah. like, I do like the fact that, you know, they decided if we're going to do a sequel, we're going to do something radically different, something that's just a totally different take on the character. Um, I, I do appreciate that, that they're not just going to do a rehash of the first movie because that would that would be lame. But anyway, I am excited to see how that that all you know shakes out. Absolutely. Uh, really appreciate everybody tuning in. Make sure to hit the like button and subscribe button. We've got to shout out the Patreon community. Lovely fuckers that keep the lights on here. Vanguardians, super Vanguardians, comrades. You're all comrades to us, but uh, you know, keeps us coming at you routinely. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow, I imagine. Uh, tomorrow, I'm actually, I got to go on local television, everybody. Humble brag Ooh. moment. The bar is getting covered by local TV. Woo! Um, for just not like for anything. the spring menu or? Oh, no, like the bookstore. Like it's like 38 the spot, like some local KC network that I think is on like channel four or something like that. If you have cable still, but I was like free advertisements, free advertisement. Come on. We in, should bro. try to play that segment on the show whenever it airs. That'd be fun. Yeah, it'd be me, Kate and Destiny just sitting there being like, this is our bar. This is what we do every day. Um, I feel like our audience would actually kind of like that, though. They always hear you talk about afterward. It might be fun to, you know, show them the Dude, actual... You should come in and shoot like a like a little... We'll, we'll shoot like a little day in the life thing. And, that's, you know, we'll follow you to the like Screenland. You and Alex can go, go on, you know, talk about the no clip film, you know? Yeah, dude, that would be basic as fuck. Some behind the scenes look at the fascinating lives of Zach and Gavin. Oh, um, <laughs> living, living like a rock star, shouty one. No. Uh, also, the other thing, Gavin, before we get off here, and it makes it harder for me to communicate with you, will you press in the number 87 on your Google Pixel 6 right now? Uh, fuck, yeah. Do you, uh, did you get logged out of something? Oh, uh, for whatever reason, it won't let me update our uh, profile picture unless I re-verify who I am. And I'm like, fuck, I don't have... Uh, I don't, I'm, you say 87? 86. I don't even see an 86. Wait, let me look again. Oh, it's 87. Sorry, tap that one. <laughs> All right, you should be good. Oh, yeah. Wow. Now we have a new logo. Everybody can see that, too, on YouTube. We have... Oh, oh fuck, well, yeah. So, shout out to Did the get updated. Uh, I don't think it's done at 100% yet on the main page, but it will in a second because it just updated on my end. And then I looked and I was like, well, not for you guys yet. But yeah, we'll have the, our new brand new logo. I think it fits the uh, I think it fits the vibe of the show now. We've retired the van era, unfortunately. Um, the documentary series were never going to never, never going to get financed, unfortunately. <laughs> Boy, did we look. Boy, did we look for some financing. Boy, did we spend a lot of our own money on that. But uh, at some point, you have to uh, call it quits. And now we're just loudmouths on the internet. So you guys are all welcome. This is a new Vanguard logo. This is the Vanguard future. And uh, yeah, we're pretty into it. Shout out to the homie Matt for getting this done for us. Yeah, huge shout out to Matt over at the Letter Hack. Obviously, sub to his channel if you're not already. Great stuff. And yeah, this is a dope new logo. We should be kind of doing a bit of an overhaul or a you know rebrand with our logos and stuff. So you know, I might make a new background for the stream yard when we're not in studio. That's another thing we're working on. But yeah, we're gonna be making some changes aesthetically. Hopefully, you guys like the new logo. We absolutely love it. I think it's so fucking fresh. Um, but yeah, the iconic Jack. Yep. I remember when Gavin got that. We quote Spring Breaker so much. It has to be that jacket had to be, you know, featured in the logo. And I yep. always, I wear, yeah, it, it was funny. The white tee, plain white tee is awesome. No tattoos on me though. So I'm, I'm getting, Ooh. I'm getting a second chance at life, everyone. <laughs> make up for all the mistakes, you know, uh, make my girlfriend's mother very happy. Uh, you know. <laughs> I'm so yeah, that's scared funny. to see her next week when I, so fucking for, for, for fun, fun fact, my girlfriend's mom, like her a lot, wonderful lady, uh, for, uh grew up, spent the first probably 30 years of her life in the Philippines. Uh, so did Salisa's dad. They're very traditional Catholic people. And uh, <laughs> wasn't a fan of that tattoos that I had before. I got two big ones and all my knuckles tattooed. So I'm just like, oh, when I come to your home next week, I hope you... <laughs> 
it's wearing long actually, sleeves. Dude, I know, but I'm like, what am I supposed to? Anyway, I've talked to Celise about this. She's like, I don't care. I'm like, well, fuck, dude. I, do. I don't want your parents to hate me. I didn't really think about this when I was sitting in a tattoo parlor. Um, That's anyway, funny. So that'll be, yeah, we'll, uh, to be just, you know, we'll, we'll revisit that for the real ones. Anyway, shout out to everyone that tuned in today better than the van since there's no van yeah exactly diet tuna there is a van it's just we can't afford to take it anywhere go, go figure there's only 211 of you watching so you yep. know we have uh, but do you know what's crazy i was talking to my homies that do local politics do you know what the physical paper circulation of the kansas city star is what is thirty five thousand? Oh, oh Ooh, seriously and, yeah and i was like holy shit that makes me feel a little bit better about myself now that doesn't Damn. include digital for them that's just the print version yeah. of it but i was like fuck man that's not so bad now that we have thirty-two thousand subscribers or whatever the <laughs> fuck we have i was like hey, yeah dude. you know and who the fuck even i mean honestly the kansas city star is such garbage and they charge so much for it it's like some insane amount of money to even read the digital version which you get like not even one free article for a month it's it's ridiculous fuck the kansas city star 100 percent. so shout out to uh shout out to you know local residents all my homies read kcur 89.3 instead uh anyway <laughs> yep. <out> everybody. <laughs> yep shout out everyone for tuning in today we'll be back tomorrow as soon as zach is done with his uh his uh, television premiere or whatever yeah, you so. know if i have time to pencil you in you know <laughs> it's like, you know you should be yeah. honored by my lateness. Then I would even go <laughs> up for this fight. No, anyway, I can't quote Kanye anymore unless it's a joke. I know I've got to break that out of my brain. Oh, also, did you see the dude from the Higgs boson? Uh, he died. The guy that invented the Higgs boson. Wait, just a at, physicist. At risk of sounding stupid as fuck. What the fuck is that? When it comes to rapping fast, I'm a Higgs boson. <laughs> that was it. You know. <laughs> Going it's an elementary but particle in the state model of particles. Do you actually know anything I, about this? I, this I, just, I just know that there's that reference to it in the Chance the Rapper song, Cocoa Butter Kisses, that I was singing along to. And <laughs> yeah. I was looking at this uh, Guardian page, and it was like the guy from Higgs Boson uh, died. And then, you know, he want to go up and hug on his grandmother, but he can't because he's stinking. Never too old for a spanking. I think we all addicted. Really dope. Anyway, shout out to you, Adi, the I'll have to read a, a scientificjournal.com article or something so I don't feel so stupid. I don't but, know yeah. anything about the Higgs boson <laughs> other than it makes things faster, obviously. I think it accelerates particles uh, would be my main huh. guess uh, so that you can you know view them. I, I don't know. I never was in. I never even took physics in high school. I was a f f <laughs> not supposed to say I'm retarded, but that's what I was. I failed honors chemistry, <laughs> so I had to take chemistry again because I didn't show up at all. And chemistry is one of those things, dude. Where if you don't know how to do it, you just can't fucking do it. Like I just never went to class. And they'd be like, balance this equation. I'd be like, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Anyway, so I failed that and had to retake it. Interesting, but yeah, shout out to a uh, shout out to Peter Higgs. Rest in peace. Propose the existence of the God particle. Is that the same thing, right? Or is that something else? Oh, yeah. No. The Higgs boson. Yeah, I'm going to do some oh. reading about this. But either way, shout out to this dude. Rest in peace. Yeah, I brought it up like I knew what I was talking about. I was just using it as a throwaway line until we decided to jump <laughs> off here. Gavin's investigating now. Oh, Audie the fuck. butt catcher, he's a smart guy. I'm sure he knows all about that guy. He can't have a mass, like as in like a funeral mass, because he talks shit on the Catholic Church or something. Is that why? Huh. I don't know. The God article. Anyway. Oh, well, yeah. that's not stupid. That's isn't being that lazy. The, oh, yeah. Isn't that the is that the thing that like people say explains why we believe in God as a species? It's like some I don't know, I'm talking out of my ass, but that, Gavin, that you've read a lot sense. about God. I, I trust you. You're a holy man. You know, this is a man that's done some digging. You know, Richard Dawkins, you know, that's a Gavin's G. That's his guy. You know, Gavin loves Sam Harris, Richard Dawkins. That's his crew. You know, yeah, honestly, if we hadn't saved Gavin, you you guys are welcome. If we hadn't saved Gavin, I think at some point he probably would have joined the intellectual dark web. Uh, you know, I'm just kidding. Just all of his favorite, uh, you know, intellectuals from, you know, 10 years ago. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. Thank you, TJ Kirk. Though. You saved him from the life of the of the dark side. Yep. Otherwise, I'd be debating Gavin about destiny or some stupid shit all day long. <laughs> and uh, Higgs boson gives something a mass. It was a joke. Oh, okay, gotcha. So it doesn't have to do with the the mass. See, Adi, Adi, just kicking us while we're down. You, do we look like dudes that paid attention in science class, Adi? <laughs> do we look like we? No. Other, I'd be a I would be a programmer. You would see me with a real nice spread up here. I'd have multiple <laughs> monitors. You know, I'd have a four hundred one k somewhere, Adi. If I knew what the fuck you were talking about. <laughs> yep. Shout out to you, Adi. Appreciate everyone tuning in today. We're gonna get out of here now. But we'll be back tomorrow, so hit that notification bell, subscribe to the channel, all that good stuff. We'll be back. Peace out, guys. Peace.
Be, 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 be